Amherst Media, are you ready? Thank you. Uh, I want to note that we have press in the audience with us tonight. Uh, this is the first meeting of the town council in which we have remote participation. So I'm just going to go over a little bit about what that means, okay? Uh, both Councillor Schoen and Councillor Balmelne have petitioned and received permission to participate in this manner because it was unreasonable for them to be here. This is permissible under 940 CMR 29.105. The information shall be recorded in the minutes, and I will now be checking with each of them to make sure that they can hear, et cetera, and they will need to go off of mute and respond. So first of all, um, Kathy, let the record reflect that board committee member, in this case, the um, town council member, Kathy Schoen is attending remotely via speakerphone for the meeting on January 7th, 2019 for the reason stated above. Councillor Schoen, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I just want to ask if you'll speak up just a little louder when you talk. Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, let the record reflect that Councillor Kathy Schoen's attendance by a speakerphone can be heard by all present at the meeting. If you're very quiet. Okay, Councillor Balmel. First of all, let the record reflect that Council Member Bal Shalini Balmel is attending remotely via speakerphone for meeting on January 7th, 2019, for the reasons stated above. Shalini, can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Okay, we're going to ask you to speak up as we do this, okay? Let the record reflect that Councillor Balmon, attendance via speakerphone, can be heard by all present at the meeting. So because we have remote participation, all votes taken during the meeting with a remote participation shall be by roll call vote. Therefore, all votes, the president or the town clerk will ask for the individual vote. In this case, we ask the town clerk to do that. Mandy, Mandy has something. I'm sorry, Mandy? We should check to make sure Kathy can hear Shalini and Shalini can hear Kathy when they speak. Thank you. Kathy, can you hear Shalini? Shalini, can you hear Kathy? Yeah, very clearly. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if te technical difficulties arise as a result of utilizing remote participation, the president will should supersede or should suspend discussion while reasonable efforts are made to correct the problem. If remote participation is disconnected, that fact and time of disconnection and if subsequent reconnection is achieved, shall be noted in the meeting minutes. I have asked each counselor in advance who is participating by remote to provide us agenda items in general that they would like to speak to. They have done so, and Councillor Haneke will indicate that the counselor participating remotely wishes to speak. So if you see Councillor Haneke going this, this are jumping up and down. It's because she's representing three people tonight. Um, not representing, but she is making sure that three people are heard tonight. Uh, re remote counselors are asked to speak by stating their name, and we would like them to continue to go by our general rules of not adding, only adding to conversations, not repeating. Um, seeing that we have a quorum, I want to call the meeting to order. It is now 634. Um, so welcome. Uh, this meeting is being broadcast live and recorded by Amherst Media. Copies of the agenda are projected up on the screen, both in front and in back. And if you are interested in speaking, we ask that you sign in in the sheet at the front door. 
Are there any announcements by members of the council or the town manager? Okay. Uh, I just want to mention two things real quickly. The Rules of Procedure Ad Hoc Committee has asked that we try a different form of addressing counselors during this meeting. I have been address asked to address counselors by their first name, and now I'm asking counselors to address me by Lynn. So we're gonna try it, okay? And we also wish to thank the League of Women Voters, Amherst Media, and Stan Rosenberg for creating and hosting Byline with Stan Rosenberg. The first edition of each of the shows can be seen on Friday nights at 8 o'clock and then on Monday nights at 6 o'clock. There are no resolutions, however, I just want to mention because we are expecting one and several people are aware of it, that the resolution in support of full funding for our public schools will be a topic at our January 28, 2019 meeting when a representative from the school committee will be present. No hearings, so we will proceed to presentations and discussions. So, we have three presentations and discussions this evening. The first is going to be with Council Bachman, uh, excuse me, Manager Bachman, and his staff. And then we are going to proceed with an agenda item on the Station Road Bridge and then on the Energy and Climate Resilience Committee proposal. We will also have public comment toward the end of the agenda for residents who wish to speak on a different issue other than these two items. So in other words, there will be different times. While our town charter requires a public comment period at every public meeting, the council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during the public comment. If your comment specifically relates to an item later on our agenda, please bring that comment forward after the council has reached that item on the agenda and stated their own position and or observations. The format for discussion when we get to that point will be as follows. The item will be introduced by the president. The president will call on the persons making formal presentations, whether they are a member of the council or town employees. This order has been predetermined. All council members will have an opportunity to speak and ask questions about the issue. As appropriate, the town manager or other town employees will respond to those questions. Only after the council has completed their discussion will the president ask for a show of hands of people who would like to be recognized to, to speak about the topic presently on the table. Depending on the number of people, we will limit that to two to three minutes. And if you go over, I reserve the right to ask you to cut it short. Uh, finally, when making comment, please advance to the desk. We now have our staff and, and Manager Bachman with us. Push the button on the mic. Identify yourself and where you live and then proceed with your comments. The first item for which there will be no public comment is the community participation officers and I'm calling on Manager Bachman. Um, thank you, most esteemed and honorable president. We good? That's okay. Most esteemed and honorable president, which is what you told me to call you when we first started. No, but. I did not. I did not. <laughs> but we'll go back to Lynn. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so section 3.3D uh, of the Home Rule Charter calls for the manager to appoint a community participation officer. The purpose of this role is to increase participation in local government by diverse residents as described in section 3.3C um, and says such officer may be a current employee. So really what the community participation officer is designed to do is, is provide support for individuals interested in being involved in local government, uh, devise and implement strategies to enhance public engagement, conduct community out outreach efforts to increase participation by underrepresented residents, uh, aid in planning and conducting the district meetings, analyze data on resident engagement, regularly submit reports to the town manager and the town council, and carry out any other duties designated by the town manager. So as I thought about this, it seemed like um, that was a lot of work for one person and that we would be highly benefited by having a team of people that would take on this task 
uh, for a couple of reasons. One, a team of people brings a much broader set of relationships and uh, experiences to the table, uh, and it also um, taps into the talents that they have already established. So specifically, I've assigned this job of community participation officer team uh, to three individuals who are, who are already employed by the town. Angela Mills is the executive assistant to the town manager. Jen Weiston is the administrative assistant in our office. And Brianna Sunrid is the communications manager for the town. These three employees um, have a wide range of experience. They, um, they ha all have children in this public school district. They are involved, many of their, their children are involved in, in sports. Um, and I think these types of attributes are the things that are gonna help engage the community. So what I wanted to do tonight is, not, you've read my memo, so I don't have to reiterate uh, that, which I just did, um, is have each of them say a few words about themselves so that the public gets to meet them, so you get to meet them, and we start this engagement process. The other thing I want to mention is on Friday, we do a normal uh, coffee, cup of joe thing, on Friday from 7.30 to 9. Uh, this week, uh, I'll be joined by uh, some, if not all, of our officers here to help engage the um, public, and it'll be held at Starbucks. So first, we'll just pass it down <laughs> to whoever's starting. Alphabetical order. My name is Angela Mills. I'm honored to be here. I have lived in Amherst on and off since 1991. I am a 1995 graduate of Amherst College. I've enjoyed all of my volunteer efforts for our town, um, most recently as a youth sport coach in volleyball, basketball, and baseball. Um, I'm on the board for Amherst Baseball. I was the co-chair of the Crocker Farm PGO for two, three years. And um, I also served on the LSSC Commission. So I come to the community participation officer job with um, an open heart and also a great enthusiasm to work with my colleagues. I did learn Spanish before I learned English at home. My parents immigrated to the US in 68. So um, Spanish was my first language. And I think that would be a great way to kind of reach out to newer parts of our community. I'm also really interested in the growing senior population that we have. I think they're a great untapped resource, and I know it's a burgeoning population, so I look forward to working with them. And then as we started to brainstorm, I really thought um, families with very young children, some of those families stick around and raise their children for all of their schooling years here in our town, and other families come and go due to the colleges and the university, but I think everybody should share the talents that they have during their time here. So I look forward to working with you and finding you space to meet with your constituents, and um, thanks for having us. And yes, my name is Jennifer Moyston, and as the town manager told you, I am the administrative assistant for the town manager's office. I'm also a human resources assistant. Um, I grew up here in Amherst, and I'm currently raising my children here as well. Um, my community involvement right now consists of coaching football, basketball, and I'm also a board member of the Amherst Survival Center. Um, what excites me most about becoming a community partner participation officer is connecting with people and the residents. I'm a very people person. I love working with people. Enhancing the opportunity for public involvement and diversifying our boards and committees. So um, prior to working for the town, I didn't know the impact that the boards and committees have on the decision making of the town. And so there are many people, residents, and folks out there who have great ideas and just don't know exactly how to get those or who to bring those ideas to. So I'm very excited about being able to be a gateway or an opening up a gateway for those people to become involved and diversifying it so that our boards and committees and hopefully employment are more of a reflection of what is, of who lives in our community as well. Hello, counselors. Thank you for having us. Um, my name is Brianna Sunred, and as the town manager said, I'm the recently communications manager for the town. I work in the IT department. Um, <clears throat> I've lived in Amherst since 2003 when I came here for undergraduate at UMass Amherst. And um, Amherst actually got me my start in local government. I worked for LSSE as a senior, and um, it really changed how I wanted, what career I wanted to go into. So I thank Amherst for that. And, uh, I was lucky enough to come back here after doing, working for um, 
nearly three years for the city of Worcester in a similar capacity. Uh, I was actually their first public outreach coordinator, um, a very large, diverse city of over 185,000 residents. And we were able to create brand new programming there, which um, my, my experience with that, I'm really excited to bring some of those elements to Amherst. Um, some of the things that we're doing now in Amherst, we're trying to create those avenues of access to participate in town government and utilize our services better. Um, we have a couple things on the horizon, um, a website redesign, um, trying to find different ways to engage with local students through civics. Um, I'm actually currently a part-time graduate student at the University of Massachusetts in public policy, where my focus is on digital governance. So we get to um, utilize some of those things that I'm learning at the university here as well. And we actually will be having an independent study graduate student aiding us in community participation work this spring semester, and we're really excited about that. Um, our chief goal, uh, just jumping off of what Jen, Jennifer and Angela said, is to make the town of Amherst approachable and accessible and inclusive to our diverse community. So we're excited to work with you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments at this time? Yes, Darcy. I'm just interested to know uh, how you're dividing up the responsibilities. I'd like to know who to call about what. <laughs> Well, you should if you know. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's early days. So we've just started to um, coordinate weekly meetings. Um, so it hasn't been completely ironed out yet. But we will have an email that reaches all three of us as well as a phone number. Um, from the, the big picture standpoint, technology, website-wise, that's kind of more will be in my wheelhouse. Um, so I can at least speak to that, but we are working on def more clearly defining those. And if you ladies have anything to add, feel free. Jennifer and I can help with space for your meetings. And if you have great ideas about constituencies that we can help you with, I think Brianna, I think the three of us are ready to handle that task. Other questions or comments? Sandy Joe. I was just thinking about uh, uh, answering Darcy's question. Do you have an email that was sent to us, get involved, which apparently is the email we'll send if you want to reach any of our community officers. We're just pointing that out. I could not hear that. Okay, uh, I'll try to speak up. Is that better? A little bit. Hello, can you hear me? Um, should I just type my response? Be careful. She just asked whether she should type it. I, th I would suggest, can you try to say it again very loud? I think we can sort of hear you. Okay, I was just referring to the email we were sent to reach the three communi uh, communication officers, the email with get involved. Yeah. Okay. If you could repeat that. So, Shalini, I'll repeat what I think we heard um, referencing the memo that from Paul um, dated December 29th, where um, to facilitate contact, we've established an email address that will reach all three officers. This email address is getinvolved at amherstma.gov. Is that correct? Yes, thank you. Okay. Yes, Dorothy. Um, if one were having a community forum and wanted to do a, a Facebook event kind of page, is that something you would help with or should we go to the IT department? So the, so the good thing, again, Brianna Sunrid, um, the good thing is I am part of the IT department, so um, by going through us, you kind of get that service as well. Um, so you would coordinate with the, the community participation officers and if there's... Um, expertise we need to borrow from another department, we'll, we'll do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Yes. Pat. I'm interested in finding out. 
finding out what you uh, think keeps people from participating in our town government. Uh, and also, um, uh, when I was in Boston, I led a parent leadership team, and we had translators when we were in different communities. So here we have a Spanish translator. Uh, are there other, will there be other opportunities, uh, if necessary, uh, to have a Cambodian translator or things like that? Thank you. Um, we could certainly look into that. It, um, having done that previously, it depends on the meeting and the population, because if you are hiring people, it gets very expensive very quickly. And while the goal would be to have multiple translations at, at any um, meeting, that's it's kind of a hard bar to, to achieve. Are there other questions or comments? Yeah, excuse me. Yes, Pat. I asked what they thought kept people from engaging in town now. Thank you. So we haven't made an exhaustive list of barriers to entry, but it is something that we've been thinking a lot about, and we've identified um, a number of things that we feel are potential barriers to entry for participation. Um, and I think that's our chief task. And I believe Angela has something to add. <laughs> Angela Mills, so we, we actually brainstormed this a little bit today. And in terms of cross-pollination, it would be an undue burden for us to go to an organization that has volunteers and say, hey, we're looking for volunteers for all of these commissions and committees. So that is really the crux of our challenge. And it's a big boat, but we're happy to row it with you. So we are brainstorming that. Okay. Other comments, questions? Great, seeing that. Uh, then let me just say, Angela, Jennifer, and Brianna, thank you very much. We really look forward to working with you. And as I think you know, we have already set up our own uh, committee, that, which is dealing with um, communication, outreach, and committee appointments. And we, we will want you to be working closely with that committee as well as all of us as counselors. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. The, the next item on the agenda is the Station Road Bridge replacement, and um, this is an item being introduced by the, to the council by the town, and there will be a period of public comment at the end of this particular part of the agenda. Mr. Bachman. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I'm here with Superintendent of Public Works, Gil Guilford Mooring, and he will be doing the major presentation. And while well, he sets that up, I'll give you a little background on this. Good. So on September 20th, 2018, the Department of Public Works, in consultation with the Mass Department of Transportation uh, bridge team, bridge inspection team, determined that the condition of Station Road Bridge was unsafe and closed the bridge to vehicular traffic. Um, I am requesting an appropriation of $332,800. $162,800 would fund the engineer, engineering work that has been contracted to move the permitting and construction for both a temporary bridge and a permanent bridge forward. Roughly $170,000 would fund the construction and installation of a temporary bridge. Those funds would be appropriate from the town's road repair to the town's road repair account that is used to, to pave town roads and sidewalks. Additional funds, we're estimating this very early stage of about $1.2 million, will be required to construct a permanent bridge if state funding is not forthcoming. In, your, in the memo in your packet, we discuss some of the alternatives, give a detailed background uh, of the history of the bridge, which uh, Mr. Mooring can give a little, a little more, in, uh, go into a little more depth if you, if you choose. Um, in terms of public outreach, we had a um, Two public meetings, one on October 30th at the Fort River Elementary School and one on December 19th at the Banks Community Center. Um, both were very well attended by uh, residents and uh, people just concerned. And uh, we have continued to, we have established a um, web, web page on the town's website to keep, put, to maintain a communication with the public. 
the way we're looking at this is um, it, it, the key issue for the uh, town council is two. One is you are the keepers of the public way. So what happens in the public way, which is a bridge is a public way, is really under your jurisdiction. The other is we need money to move this project forward. We have uh, allocated some funds from an existing account that, uh, is, that is usually dedicated to road and sidewalk paving uh, because there is an urgency to move this project forward in, our, in my estimation. Um, but we are also asking for an appropriation of funds. My, I, what my request is to the council tonight is that it gets referred to your, to your finance committee so we can go a little more in depth about the funding options and things like that. And if you're ready, but this is not showing. Here we go. So good evening, Madam President, council members. I've Hi. always wanted to say that, sorry. <laughs> and I only have a couple other things I've never said, and I'll try to work that in sometime in my life, I hope. Okay. Um, so this is an update that the uh, CDM, our camp dresser, McGee Smith, our consulting engineers, provided to us. And it's just a quick overview of what's going on. Um, I'm sorry I didn't come play with this computer before, but it's not kind of doing the same thing my computer was doing with the presentation. So <clears throat> this is the bridge. Uh, project need basically is Mr. Bachelman said, on the 20th, we kind of went out there and decided we need to close the bridge. The mass DOT inspector who was standing on the bridge when a car drove across it and hopped him, uh, he uh, agreed quite quickly that we needed to close the bridge and concurred with our findings. Um, you can see there's a lot of corrosion on the bottom of the stringers. Uh, that's the part that's failing at this point. Uh, what's been done so far is just kind of a, <clears throat> a list of all the things we've done. We haven't been just waiting to see what was going to happen next. We have been working pretty diligently. The biggest things we have done is we have submitted an application to the uh, Mass DOT for their small bridge municipal program, which is to get money from the state to actually replace the bridge. Um, the only issue with that amount of money is, is that's a reimbursement account. And you get reimbursed and you only get money from the date they approve the project. So until they approve the project, everything we spend on this project comes out of the town coffers and they will not reimburse us out of this program. There may be other programs that might come into play, but at this time, that's the only way this program works. <clears throat> We've also submitted the technical drawings and technical specifications we need to for a temporary bridge, and that's being reviewed by the DOT at this time as well. So <clears throat> when we first started out this project, we were looking at three options. Do not pay attention to the dates. This was very early in the process. CDM was working with me trying to figure out what the options were, what the cost would be for a temporary bridge. <clears throat> we kind of narrowed down this first one, a, pre a prefabricated structure, which was gonna have the least impact to the wetlands and the resource area, and the least impact to the actual roadway that, that was there. Um, for the temporary bridge, we've uh, worked our way through the items here. We have basically a foundation design. We have basically an allowable loading we can put on the foundation. And we have a basic type of bridge we can accept without doing a lot of changes. <clears throat> Mass Highway, like I said, is reviewing that. And we're hoping they'll approve us and tell us we can go out to bid. So these are the type of bridges we've been looking at. Uh, the <clears throat> these two at the bottom are basically what are sometimes referred to as Bailey bridges. They were designed during the Second World War as a temporary fast expedient bridge. The only issue with those is that you do raise the road surface up or you have to dig down deeper to put the bridge in. <clears throat> the safety box bridge, which is in the top right corner of the screen, my right corner, that's, uh, that bridge takes less uh, space out of the existing roadway and take less space from the waterway below it. It's a little bit better design. Um, this is our schedule we've been working on. <clears throat> we are right now, we do have a Conservation Commission meeting on Wednesday. So the NOI has been submitted, <clears throat> and the Conservation Commission will start reviewing that. There is some other additional impacts or input into the conservation. Uh, <clears throat> natural heritage has to, 
natural heritage has to speak up about the endangered species that live there. We do have we do have two um, that endangered species that live in the area. So again, this is what uh, our requirements are. Everything about this bridge is in critical habitat or in a resource area. It's just a bridge over a, a stream which has got a lot of wetlands around it on both sides. So we're also working on the permanent design. Uh, the foundation for the permanent bridge is probably the biggest issue we're working on right now. We had a soil boring company out there and they drilled uh, borings into the ground and took samples of the soil. Um, the soil is nothing but silty clay sand, which is, uh, we had 80 feet of that. There's no bedrock anywhere around to set the bridge on. So we have to come up with a type of design for the foundation, which is a little different from the, what most people do in Massachusetts. It's not different than what you do down south, and it's basically the same foundation that I started out and when I started out in my career. It's just probably gonna be a pile foundation on top of the sand to bear this load. But it is different than what they do in New England, and it's different than what most people are used to up here. The bridge will be longer. It has to be longer because it has to accommodate the stream crossing standards, which is what's been put in place to get, provide a better passing for the water and for the environmental critters that live in the stream and pass through the stream channels. Um, we have uh, a lot of right-of-way issues we have to deal with. Basically, we gotta stay within the right-of-way. We can't go outside. Conservation land on three sides and one side is what's called watershed protection land. Um, in order to use those lands, you have to go to the state and you have to get permission from the state. Um, one's the legislature, one's the Department of Environmental Protection. So anything time we go to the state that just slows the project down, so if we stay within the right-of-way, we'll be much better. And we think we've been able to do that. Um, and then this is our schedule we're working on right now for the permanent bridge schedule. It's not as big as the temporary one because as we start getting into the more, more of the actual topics, we'll start expanding those out and having more tasks we have to do in those topics. But that's this, this is the basic outline of what we have to do for the permanent bridge. Again, lots of, we'll have to get back to the CONSCOM to get permitted for the permanent bridge. There'll be lots of additional requirements we have to have because we'll be working in the water. Uh, we'll be working in the home of one of those endangered species and we'll be working close to the habitat of one of those endangered species. So we'll have to deal with that. Um, we will also have to do some replication because we'll be taking some of the resource area. We'll have to find a place to do some type of replication and we'll also have to do some type of comp Compensatory storage because we'll be widening the bridge out and we'll be filling what's the floodplain. We have to figure someplace else to accommodate that area we're filling for the floodplain. Those are the things beyond the bridge. You know, it's not just a simple bridge you put in, you have to fit it into the environment that the bridge is in. And then this is right now the proposed temporary bridge plan. And I'll skip this and go to the next presentation because it talks more about money, which I think everyone's dying to know. Okay. Are there questions either first as clarifying and or specific to the presentation this far? I'm sorry, Pat. When you say widening press, the... Press, you have to I move have closer. It. Okay. Uh, when you say widening the bridge out, are you talking to expanding the uh, to two-lane bridge or what? Uh, yes, I actually have a picture in the next next little presentation. Might help me with that. Okay. I turned myself off. Sorry. Mandy Joe. Mm, this one's for me. <clears throat> you mentioned a nat national heritage review. Is that a federal government review? And if so. Is that on hold until the government reopens? No, that's the state agency that does that re review, and actually they've already started, and we expect to have some comments back soon. We've had a lot of experience doing stuff with uh, natural heritage, um, and they have a lot of experience with us, and they know if they don't speak very quickly, um, they need to speak very quickly with us at times. So they are already started. Okay. Okay. Dorothy. You said you would take some money from uh, road and sidewalk funds. 
would that money be replaced at some future date? I think the town manager will address that shortly after I finish with this. Okay. Yeah, Andy. So I, I had two questions and one was related to what was just asked uh, and that is uh, if there's any specific projects that were planned for this year from the road and sidewalk uh, funds that are not going to be able to be done this year as a result of this change um, it would be helpful to know about that. And the second question is, um, having worked with you on the uh, bridge that's below Puffer's Pond Dam, which is almost completed, uh, in it, but in process, how does that process um, that was used compare to the process we're engaging in here? <clears throat> Actually, let me, I kind of work that into my presentation here about how the process will go. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'll answer that. So. Great. And Any then, other clarifying questions specific to the presentation thus far? Yes, Mandy Jo. I have a request from Shalini. Okay. Shalini, speak up, please. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yay. Okay. <laughs> So uh, the question was, have we considered loaning a bridge from the state? Yes, we have. So <clears throat> I'll go ahead and answer that question. That kind of goes back to the slide we had. If we borrow a bridge from the state, they have certain bridge types, and that requires us to actually build up higher, the road higher, and put more impact into the actual resource area. So we've been trying to stay away from that and try to, to reduce the impact as much as we can to the little site we're in. It's a very tight site. We have a water line on one side and there's actually a skew in the road. And when I bring the picture back up that shows the layout of the temporary bridge, you'll see this skew is pretty, pretty dramatic. Um, if we use anything that the state has, like a Maybe or, Maybe or a Bailey Bridge, you actually have to make it a good deal longer as a temporary bridge just because of the way it's designed to have a bunch of safety factors built into it. But we'd end up with a 30 foot long bridge. And the 30 foot long bridge would actually shoot you into a part, would direct you, sorry, not shoot you. It would direct you as you're driving. Some people might shoot their car that way, but it would direct your car into a wetland area and then you'd have to make a sharp adjustment to the left to uh, get back on track and not go into the water. So from the alignment of the structure, a longer bridge for the temporary bridge makes it a little more difficult. And I'll show you in the picture and I'll point that out. Other questions at this time? Then let's go on with the next presentation. Okay, this is what everybody sees when you go to the bridge now. So we've broken the project, I kind of broke the project cost down to reflect uh, this is the permanent bridge cost here and in your memo you have an overall cost and as I went through I broke out the overall cost and I broke out some of the money because as when you see in the town manager's uh, memo he's kind of rounded numbers together and this is kind of more of an exact number and you can see where some of the rounding comes in but for the permanent cost we're looking at about seven hundred forty thousand dollars for the bridge and because we're so far out in the construct in the design right now we have a very healthy contingency of 20%, which is another $150,000. And then we have a mobilization and demobilization charge. Usually that's inside the bid documents, but this number we've pulled out because that's the way the consultant likes to do it is keep that separate. Um, but we expect to find that number in the bid when we bid it. So we're looking at roughly 925,000 for the structure, for the contractor to move on site, take out whatever's there, but whether it's the old bridge or whether it's a temporary bridge, to actually relocate the water line and to install the new bridge. That's what we're lo looking at as a possible cost right now, just to put in the permanent bridge. Temporary bridge, we're estimating to be about $170,000. We put a contingency cost on that one and a MOB cost on that one, a DMOB. Um, and this is roughly around $200,000, and that's what we've rounded it off in the town manager's memo. So if we continue with the plan we're on now to do a per temporary bridge, then a permanent bridge, we're looking at 1.3 as to being our total cost for this project, 
you round it off, it's 1.4. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Right now we're below the number of 227 for engineering costs. We're about 163, 164 right now. Um, that's basically the way we're doing the task orders to the engineer. There'll be a final task order for the construction oversight. Um, we've worked with CDM a great deal. They know what we're capable of. They're comfortable with some of the things we're able to do as far as inspections and on-site supervision. Uh, as we move towards the type of structure we're building and we actually bid out the permanent structure, we'll sit down together and we'll figure out what the town will oversee and what the contract, the consultant engineer will have to oversee for us. Um, so that number 227 may go down because we may do more of that oversight as we've done in the past with projects with them. But right now, we're looking at uh, a price of 1.4. When we started this project out, the rough estimate we had was $2.4 million, and we whittled a million dollars off so far, and as we keep working this project, we're hoping to get some more savings out of it, but we're not gonna see another million dollars worth of savings. We're talking about the next probably amount of savings will be a, either 100 or 200,000 at the most. But this is how this has worked. So if, I know you have my original memo or seen my original memo, which says 2.4 was the original and now we've kind of worked this down. And as we work it down, as we get closer and find out things and understand more of what's going on. Soil exploration was probably one of the biggest things that we had to find out a lot about, and we know a lot more now. So that was a big, a big unknown. Uh, the wetlands issues, we now completely understand those as well, and we also understand the hydraulic issues, the water flow through the channel as well. So those were big answers. So that's the overall cost. We're still on track with the schedule. I just put this in again. This is the same schedule I showed you earlier. Permanent bridge schedule, if we keep going the way we're going, we're hoping to be done by the end of August of 2020. The temporary bridge, we're hoping to have in place mid-April mid of this year, if we keep going the way we're going. And then this here is the alignment I was telling you about. So as you see in the middle, this is a little part right here is the bridge. And that's the temporary bridge lined up. Um, that's to avoid kind of shooting off into the side over here into the water if you're coming from the east and to keep from having to relocate the water line now, right now before the temporary bridge. The water line is right here on the side of the bridge. We're trying to not move that right now. That would just delay installation of a temporary bridge. But as you can see, this blue dashed line is your wetlands. Wetlands over here. And then property ownership, this side is conservation, conservation, and then watershed land up here with the far horse farm was. So that's the overall layout. What the bridge will look like when we're done is a little like this bridge, which is on East Leverett Road. When we talk about width of the bridge, it will be two lanes, so it'll be two 11-foot lanes or two 12-foot lanes, depending on what the state tells us to do. The difference between this bridge and East Leverett Road, if you want to look at it, and the permanent bridge is there will be some type of shoulder. There'll be a four or five-foot shoulder on each side, so that's another possibly 10 more feet of added space. Sidewalk is another issue. We have to decide with the state, and the state has to agree whether we put a sidewalk on the bridge um, state requirements is that you have a, two travel lanes, two shoulders, two sidewalks. So we're going to have to apply for some waivers from the state. Hopefully you can wave out the sidewalks and just do shoulders on the side and then have the two travel lanes. So <clears throat> that is, Indy's question was about how this, how does this compare to Andy. So how, how, how did it compare to the process in the Puffers Pond Bridge? So the really great thing about how this compares to Puffers Pond Bridge is Puffers Pond Bridge was state money and a state project. The state controlled that project from the start to the finish. They came to the town and asked us if we, want, if they, if we wanted them to fix the bridge. We said yes, we want to fix it sort of like this. And then they went off and hired an engineer. They controlled the engineer. They directed the engineer. And now they're building the project and directing and controlling the project. 
the amount of money the town has in that bridge project is less than about ten thousand dollars because i did some changes to some storm drainage which actually made the project easier for them to design it and kept us from having a lot of extra pipe out there so that was totally managed by the state if we're approved by the municipal small bridge program to do the project we manage the project we drive the project if we get no money from the state and we have to pay for it with town money we manage the project we drive the project so we don't have to do a lot of stuff with the state except get their approval on the designs and once their approval is done on the design we can make things happen at the rate we want to make them happen so that's the two differences the state project on, on Mill Street Bridge was totally funded, totally managed by the state. What we want to do is have them fund it, but let us manage this project. And no matter what, we're man going to probably manage this project. What's not going to get done right now, if we're, like I said, we're like $160,000 into this project. If we don't replenish that money back to the road repair funds, that's money we can't use in the spring for doing pothole patching. What we've been doing is taking money we, re we receive in the budget and the capital, and we try to keep 100 to 200,000 left over. Actually, we try to keep 200,000 left over. So as soon as the asphalt plants open in the spring, we can start patching roadways. Uh, you cannot use Chapter 90 money for patching the roadways. You can only use Chapter 90 money for actually doing overlays and repairs, major repairs to your roadways. So that 160,000 out of that account, I, there's only probably about $50,000 left for pothole repairs in the spring. Okay. Additional questions? Councilor, I'm sorry, Mandy Joe. So again, this one's on from, from me. Um, a, a couple, you just touched on one of them, which was the 160 that is being spent or is a portion of the town manager's request is currently, it has been taken from pothole repairing. So I guess one of my questions is, I, part of it is to the town manager, is there anything of that 162 that hasn't been already contracted out um, such that if a temporary bridge, if the council doesn't approve a temporary bridge, is there any of that money that would not need sort of refunded to road repairs. Um, and I guess I've, I've got a question on the t permanent bridge timeline of the design on a temporary bridge is very quick, but the permanent timeline had it quite long, eight months. Um, and so what's the difference in that, that, that sort of timeline as to why a permanent bridge design that's not the bid part, because I, I understand that, takes so much longer than the one that you've been working on for temporary. So what the difference is, as I told you, the, the task and the temporary bridge are already kind of exploded out. This task for the permanent design is compressed. It also has all the environmental permitting in it. So as I told you before, we're going to have to have a lot more environmental permitting in the permanent bridge because we're going to be in the water, we're going to be taking, we're going to be taking resource area, we're going to be impacting the floodplain. So those are things we're not impacting. Those three things are not being done in the temporary bridge. So that's not something part of, part of that permitting process, but it is definitely part of the process that will be in the permanent bridge design. So there's more environmental permitting, which has been lumped in right now with the bridge design. That's if you read that one, it says includes environmental permitting. So there's three more tasks in environmental permitting that we're not doing for the temporary because we're not being required right now to do that. And as for the funding, so we have contracted, you can help me how much, I, kn I know how much we've contracted for, but I'm not sure how much we've spent. If we were to say, like if, the, if we were to say just stop everything now, um, I'm not sure how much has actually been spent at this point in time. Maybe Guilford knows that. But um, much of the work that's being done now will apply for either a temporary or a permanent bridge. A lot of the environmental work applies to both along those lines. Do you know how much we've actually spent? So I don't know exactly how much we've spent. They haven't sent in their last invoice to me. The thing to do is look at the schedule. 
So we won't have to do the finalize the plan for the bid. We'll have to, we will be able to stop talking to Mass DOT, and there'll be no advertisement, no shop approvals, and none of that stuff at the bottom of the project. We'll, all that work will stop on the temporary bridge if you say stop the temporary bridge. So it's probably about 10 grand in there of that 160 that is, was, is detailed probably towards that work. And that's probably a low estimate, but it's probably about 10 grand. Dorothy. Um, I don't know how much the um, Puffers Pond bridge cost, but I, I felt there was an implication when you were stressing that the town would be doing all the supervision that somehow you think you could do it cheaper. Is that correct? There's no DOT employees here, are there? Um, we, we do do it cheaper. Um, if you talk to most communities, when they build something with Chapter 90 or town funds, it does come out cheaper. Um, it's just there's a lot of oversight and a lot of protections um, and a lot of, a lot of steps built into the Mass DOT project because of the way the Mass DOT projects work. Um, we have protections, we have oversight, uh, we don't do it to the extent they do it, so there is some savings there. Um, we also, um, we also can make the project go a little smoother because when there's a change that comes up, it doesn't have to go all the way to the district office or it doesn't have to go all the way to, to Boston to be approved. It can be handled rather quickly. It's normally handled at my office and that's as far as it has to go. Um, it usually is taken care of quickly so it doesn't drag on. Um, when you have larger projects that like Mass DOT do, does, they have more oversight and more, more of this stuff built in. And it's protect themselves and protect the state money on these bigger projects. These are much smaller and we can move, move a little faster. So yes, we typically do save money. Darcy. Is it possible to um, reuse or sell the temporary bridge once we're done with it? It, it depends on what type of bridge we get. Um, and it depends also on how comfortable we feel with the design of the permanent bridge. If the temporary bridge comes in as a rental, someone bids a rental and says we're going to rent you this bridge and the rental price is going to be within our budget, we may just rent the bridge and then turn it back over to them and then we don't have any bridge we have to deal with. If it uh, comes in as a good price and we use the bridge, we can turn around and try to use it again someplace else. Um, we do have bridges in the watershed area which um, do not have to be approved by Mass DOT. They have to be approved by the town. Uh, we can possibly take one of those bridges out and replace it with this bridge. Um, there's all sorts of possibilities depending on what the bridge type is that we actually choose. So yes, there's a good possibility we can either reuse it or resell it. It's going to be harder to resell than reuse. Mandy Joe. Kathy has a question. Okay. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes in fact, a little too loud. <laughs> okay, and now it can whisper. Um, I couldn't see the slides as, the, as it was being described about the sidewalks. Are the sidewalks issue only for the temporary bridge? Will the permanent bridge have sidewalks? So the temporary bridge will only be one lane of traffic. There will be no sidewalks on the bridge and no shoulders on the bridge because we don't want to change the width of the impact area we're hitting right now. So the temporary bridge will just be big enough for traffic to go across. Trucks, there will be no, no ability for tractor trailers to go across it. Some of the garbage trucks will not be able to go across it. There might be a few landscapers who have really big trucks and long trailers who may not be able to go across it. It'll be able to accommodate passenger vehicle, pickup truck, small trailer with a, on a pickup truck, and an ambulance. Fire truck? No fire truck. Other questions? Yes, Alyssa. This is perhaps more for the town manager, and I realize you indicated earlier you were looking to this, have this referred to our brand new finance committee. But could you give us a sense, I believe, I don't want to misstate, but I believe that it was indicated that there would be no money for pothole repair in 2019 if we were to do this. And I'd like to be clear on that, and if so, 
where else can we transfer money to to do that because it's obviously not possible to figure out other ways to do that but I would like to know if what our takeaway right now is we do this no pothole repairs in 2019 thank you for I, I should clarify that that's a really good question so we would take the money that we're already spending and then replenish the pothole account with free cash probably it depends we have not gone to a, where the source would come it could come from stabilization funds or it could come from free cash and that's a discussion we'd want to have with the Finance Committee as to where that money would come from. So we would have a new infusion of money to, to make the um, pothole account whole, basically. I have a question, and that is, if you did not do the temporary bridge, could you deliver on the permanent bridge faster? So that was a new question I hadn't heard before, and I was asked that earlier today and I sat down and started thinking about it a little bit. The answer is more than likely there's a lot of things you can do if you don't have a temporary bridge there. Um, once, if a temporary bridge is not put in, you could start realigning the water line or making accommodations to realign the water line now instead of waiting until the bridge construction starts. Um, someone else could do that, those pieces. Um, if you were not to, I mean, you could actually start demolition of some of the bridge, although that would impact people who walk. We haven't taken the bridge out now because we've been leaving it open for walkers and bicyclists. Um, so it kind of it would kind of depend. You would be in a situation, and it's a it's a iffy situation. You don't know really the answer right now. Um, the state could come back and say everything's okay with the permanent bridge, and we can start bidding and. We might go faster, which I don't know if we really can or not. Um, it's a big if. <clears throat> you, there could be things we could do. We may not be able to do things, even if we take, don't have a temporary bridge there. It may just sit empty until we start construction in 2020. So it's kind of a hard question, and you need to know a little more. We have to be farther along to know a definitive answer. But if we're farther along than there's a definitive answer, we've pushed off the temporary bridge. Okay. Are there other questions from the council? Yes, Evan. So just for clarification, the, the state funds that we've applied for, uh, any money we spend, it's a reimbursement, but any money we spend prior to uh, receiving them, if we do, uh, is on our own, we wouldn't be reimbursed for, correct? That's correct. Okay. Do we have any idea of a timeline of, of when that funding decision may be made? We do and we don't. <laughs> um, talking to the district office, they're reviewing it now, so they will have a very good idea of whether they would recommend it or not soon. The question is, is there doesn't seem to be much money or many of these grants being made right now. Um, it's supposed to be a, a revolving application, and as the applications come in, they look at it, and then they fund them based on that. So we haven't got a definite answer from Boston about that. So the state will know pretty soon what they want to do, how they want to proceed, and then they'll let us know, and then we'll just have to see if they actually get money. Other questions? Yes, Mindy Jo. Um, what's the lifespan of the permanent bridge? I'm trying to think of like cost of permanent versus the requested cost of the temporary here. So what, what's the general lifespan of a permanent bridge that we're looking at? Um, and then the other question I had, let me see if I can find it, is, uh, let me start there because, okay. So lifespan normally is 50 years. So we normally build a bridge to last 50 years and then have some type of rehab and overhaul that'll give you another 50 years of life out of it. Um, we have many bridges in town which are well over 50 years um, and they're doing quite well. The bridge, the bridge on Bridge Road uh, that had a small repair probably about 25 years ago, I believe, before I g came here. Um, and the bridge is in very good condition. Um, so there's other bridges. The bridge on um, West Street 
has some minor issues, mostly with guardrails, not with the structure of itself. Um, that was done in 80, 85. Um, cool thing about that bridge is there's only eight pages to the plans. I got a copy of those plans. I was really excited. It was only eight pages. There's going to probably be about 100 pages in the bridge plans for this bridge, and I'm going to be like, really? Uh, but anyhow. <clears throat> but that bridge is still in good shape, too. Only the guardrails have an issue. Um, so most of the bridges last definitely 50 years, and then you go from there with a little, little overhaul if you have to. Andy Joe. I remembered my other question. It relates to if we install a temporary bridge in a, the, the timeline you're not so sure on a permanent bridge, and we don't know about the grant. So I guess my question relates to if the temporary bridge is installed. Um, does would that potentially last long enough for if we don't get a mass bridge grant this year to be able to wait and apply again in order to maybe fund again and keep that temporary bridge in place until we could potentially get funding even if it's in a year or two so that the permanent bridge maybe takes longer i, I hope you're getting where my question is going on that yes uh depending on the type of bridge is uh if you do uh so if we go back to the Bailey type, Mayberry type bridges, um, they're maintenance intensive, but they, la they can last a long time as you're always tightening bolts. You have to tighten bolts, you have to inspect them, make sure they don't have to get loose. The other bridge is a one piece construction. It's welded, it stays in place. It's pretty much there until you take it out. Um, so there is the possibility that your temporary bridge could be there longer. There are communities that have temporary bridges that still are in place. Um, there's one in Northampton when you go to the uh, <coughs> um, wildlife refuge over there in the meadows. Um, mm -hmm. The name of it's missing my brain right now. It starts with an A. Um, Arcadia, right? Arcadia. Okay. David, oh, says, David says yes. There's actually a, there's actually a Bailey Bridge over there um, that's been there since been there longer than I've been in this area, so it's been over 21 years. What would the exact savings be, or close to the savings be, if we did not do the temporary bridge? Right off the bat, I would say you're going to at least save the 200000 that we were asking for for that bridge. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Dorothy. But that would mean a long period of time in which a fired engine could not go across the bridge. Is that correct? A fire engine will not be, a go, be able to go across a temporary bridge either. So yes, we would be in August of 2020 before the bridge opens. Yes, Paul. Can I just address that? Because. Um, a number of people worried about uh, the public safety. And so the first thing we did when the DPW was thinking about closing the bridge was contact the uh, police chief and the fire chief to say, what is the impact on public safety? Mm -hmm. And um, the police chief felt like there was minimal impact because they could get to wherever they needed to go anyway. Um, and the fire chief felt that they, would, they may take an alternate route to get to uh, where they need to go Oftentimes, if they're going to the neighborhood in Amherst Woods, they might go up Belchertown Road in that way anyway because they cannot go down Southeast Street because of the overpasses. The tr trucks cannot get underneath the overpasses. Um, if one of the concerns from many people was, well, if, I'm, if I need to get to Cooley Dickinson fast, Station Road, I know, they know for a fact, and everybody knows that's the, it's fastest to go down Station Road, which is true. Um, the, when I raised that issue with the fire chief, his response was the most important time increment you want to look at is how long it takes us to get to the patient because he says we have a virtual emergency room on wheels. Having a paramedic at the side of a patient that needs support and there uh, is the most important increment. And the biggest thing that impacts that is actually traffic in the time of day as opposed to um, the, the actual route, because they can get pretty much anywhere pretty quickly. Additional questions from the council? Yes, Mandy Jo. Um, at one of the first public meetings, you talked about a 
bridge on, I don't remember whether it was Pomeroy Road or Pomeroy Court that is also potentially being watched for closure. And I know this doesn't really relate to the station road bridge per se, but how is that on the actual main Pomeroy Road or was it on the court? Because I guess I'm thinking about if that one's close to potentially being closed and we put a temporary bridge in, you're still not getting your traffic lines. So can you talk about that potential relationship? So it is the, br road, the bridge on Pomeroy Road, not Pomeroy Court. Um, it's actually, we're watching it not because of a bridge issue. Uh, we've actually been trying to figure out how to replace the bridge for sidewalk so we can connect the sidewalk, which goes from the South Common to the Pomeroy Village Center. So we've been watching the bridge and we've been trying to get the state um, and to look at it more because we want to replace it for sidewalks. And I forgot that piece when I was at the meeting, but my town engineer reminded me that that's the reason why they were watching that bridge. They were trying to push that one for a sidewalk project more than anything else. So it's still, it's been inspected recently. It's okay. Um, and it's, in, in, it's actually, the state actually put it on their small bridge, municipal small bridge inspection list. And uh, it's still being looked at, but that one we're, we're pushing on more because we want to put sidewalks and connect that. So it's not a structural problem with the bridge. Um, two questions. Um, if we put a one lane bridge in here, is it correct to assume that we would have stoplights or something at either side of the bridge? Uh, the consultant is proposing that we use stop signs. I see. And the, um, light, the line of sight is sufficient? It will be. We will back up. Um, if you. So the stop line will be here, yeah. and the stop line will be here. So you're getting pushed pretty far back from the it bridge where you have to stop and let another car go across. Uh, I, I, <coughs> I'm not sure Mass Highway is going to agree to that, um, but that's what we're proposing right now. The second question is, if we put a temporary bridge in, do we damage our chances of getting the state money for the small bridge program? Originally, I thought we might damage our chances for that, but since the program doesn't seem to be on a continuous rolling basis and there seem to be people submitting things and constant review going on, it doesn't seem to be happening. I don't think we're going to damage our chances as much. Uh, there is a possibility. We'll know sooner about that, but I don't think there will actually be a, a damage to our possibilities to get the grant if we put the temporary bridge in. In the proposal for the temporary bridge, uh, actually for the permanent bridge for the small uh, bridge program, did you calculate into that uh, reimbursement for our labor since we would be overseeing that and doing the work? <coughs> if, if we actually end up doing a lot of that work, some of that work would, is reimbursable and is in, is in the numbers. Uh, if we decide to just contract it out, it's all covered in those numbers as well. Okay, thank you. Other questions from the council? Yes, Mandy Jo. Just a quick one. The, if we get in the small bridge program, what's the percentage of cost they cover? Is it 100% of after approval or is it some lesser percentage? Uh, usually it's 100% of what they approve. The question is what do they approve? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's much like the school pro projects we've been talking about in the past where they won't, they won't fund a pool. Um, so if we come up with something we want to add on to this bridge, which they don't think is necessary, uh, they may not fund that piece to it. Um, it's highly unlikely that we'll come up with something like that, although I've been told there used to be a diving board on this bridge and that we should historically recreate the diving board. Um, they would probably not pay for the diving board. We would have to do that. So that's, the, that's where you're at in this program. Yes, Mandy Jo. And this one, Shalini has a question. Shalini, please. Yeah, this is Shalini. Um, so what would be the increased time for an ambulance to go from the house to a hospital like a Bay State or uh, Cooley Dickinson if you didn't have a temporary bridge? Um, this is Paul uh, Shalini. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have an increase in time increment. Um, mm -hmm. 
exactly, so I don't know the answer to that question. Um, again, what I think when I talked to the fire chief about it, um, he said mm -hmm. some, sometimes they would choose to use station road. Sometimes they might choose to use a different road depending on where they were going in the in the traffic patterns. But I, I don't I don't have an answer mm -hmm. to your question. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions from the council? All right. Let me just re ask for a show of hands of those people from the audience who would like to speak to this issue only. I see two, three, four. Is there anybody else? Okay, have you all registered? If you have not, please make sure that before I call you up, you do register. And you'll come up, you'll sit at one of the mics, make sure the mic is on. Uh, we'd like to have you contain your remarks to no more than three minutes. And if the person before you has already made the point, we ask that you respect your time as well as ours and move on to any new points you would like to make. May I have the first person come on up? Sure, please. Both of you. So I'm Martha Hanner. I live at 18 Alyssum Drive in Amherst. Um, uh, so I am in the area of South Amherst that is impacted. Just want to say that this uh, closure of Station Road is a big impact on the whole traffic flow in the South Amherst area. When you stop and think that Station Road is the only direct east road in between, east-west road in between uh, the town center and Bay Road way down at the, at the south end of Amherst. And so we really do feel the urgency to get a temporary bridge in just as soon as possible. Local businesses are also impacted. I've spoken with several. Uh, everyone that makes deliveries is concerned because they are having to pay their employees extra time. Uh, to go, drive around the detours and making deliveries. And we are concerned about hazardous conditions on these uh, detour secondary roads uh, during winter time as well. So we uh, would like to request certainly that the council approve the temporary bridge. We'd also like to request that the council uh, help to expedite any areas that are under your control, such as approving the funding uh, or working with our local conservation committee uh, to expedite things so that the, uh, that the proposal for the temporary bridge can go out to bid and get the contractor and get to work just as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hammond. I'm Peter Berrick. I live at 87 Woodlot Road. Uh, like Martha, I'm in one of the areas that's most affected uh, by the absence of uh, being able to get across Hopbrook on Station Road. Uh, I don't want to repeat what Martha has already said. I think she said it very well. Uh, at the, I want to thank uh, Guilford Mooring and Paul Bockelman for the clarity with which they have been presenting information about the both stages of the bridge project. Uh, and I hope you find that helpful to you in your deliberations. Uh, at the meeting on December 19th, the engineers from CDM Smith spoke about the possibility that a permanent bridge design uh, could be done in such a way, it could be built in such a way so that the temporary bridge could remain in place uh, while the first phase of the permanent bridge was constructed. Uh, and then removed after it was possible to use the permanent bridge, uh, use half of the permanent bridge. I'm wondering whether that plan is still uh, in the works or whether there is any possibility of avoiding that five month period with no bridge at all once the construction starts for a permanent bridge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The other people that would like to comment. Yes, back, way back here on the to my right. Young man, please come forward. I would just like to remind everyone that the fire chief and police chief said that there isn't any safety impact to 
having Station Road closed, and because of that, we shouldn't really worry about that issue. Thank you. Thank and your name, sir? Uh, Julian Hines, 54 High Street. Thank you. Another, there was one other comment. Yes. Good evening. My name is Nancy Keefe. I've been a resident of 10 Poets Corner in East Amherst for, since 2001. And I really appreciate Ms. Um, Pam's um, input this evening about the appropriation of sidewalk um, finances, if they would be taken away in this case, to support any changes that may be needed in this case for the new bridge or uh, for the bridge. Um, I have become increasingly concerned and have started an informal needs assessment in my neighborhood of the landlords and residents and students in the landlord properties concerning the safety issues of the sidewalk that goes specifically from the intersection of Main Street, Southeast Street, Northeast Street, down to Ward Street across from the Amethyst Brook. The lack of lighting is dangerous. The lack of cut through, cut into the earth that goes along the sidewalks and the gravel that has not been removed. I don't use a car, so I have been accustomed to this now for the last eight months where I'm on foot and I see the issues that are not safe. So as a course of public way that Mr. Balkerman referred to, and my own safety, um, I will walk home tonight. It's 1.6 miles, and part of it is in the dark. Okay, this is an area that, that, that I would like to, and I look forward to the town looking into. Coincidentally, it did come up this evening. I thank you very much. Were there any other comments? Okay, this is where I very briefly am going to try to summarize and then ask for an action. Uh, obviously, this is an issue of serious importance to many residents of our town. And we have had a number of opportunities where uh, both the town manager and um, Guilford have been available and made presentations. Um, they will also be available to the Finance Committee as they do further deliberations and perhaps some of these additional questions might be forwarded at that time. Obviously the question before the Council is whether or not to build a temporary bridge or move directly to a permanent bridge. What is the cost of that and what are the trade-offs in terms of what else we might not be able to do as a town? With that, um, I'd like to ask a council member to make the following motion. To refer the question of the Station Road Bridge replacement to the Finance Committee and ask that the review, they review the matter as expeditiously as possible and return to the council on January 28, 2019 with a recommendation for action regarding this matter. Do I hear a motion? Andy Joe? So moved, because it's too long to repeat. Okay. <laughs> By memory. That's fine. Second? Second. Pat? So that was Mandy Joe made, uh, made the motion and Pat seconded it. Uh, this is the first of our, um, if, is there any other um, discussion at this time regarding the motion? If not, then we, yes, I'm sorry. Just to clarify, the motion requires that the Finance Committee submit its recommendation by our next meeting? Yes. Okay. Any other clarification questions? All right. So we have to do a roll call, and I will ask the town clerk to conduct that roll call. If you could, let's do the first two people that are remote so that we make sure that happens. Councillor Baumill? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Greismer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. And Councillor Swartz? Yes. Okay. Unanimous. The vote is unanimous, and thank you very much for those of you that have been here 
for that part of the meeting. Um, do you want a break? Okay, we're gonna make, take a brief, very brief five minute break and come back, okay? That's good. Can you confirm? Yes. Thank you. And Councillor Balmoon? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, we're going to move on to the Energy and Climate Resilience Committee. This is a proposed committee. And in this case, we're actually going to begin this being introduced by two counselors, Darcy Dumont and Evan Ross. They have worked countless hours to bring this to us this evening. And I can attest to that because a couple times I actually sat and worked with them. Um, so we'll begin with their presentation about the proposed committee. And then Mr. Bachelman will introduce some town presentations as well. And then we'll go through a similar process to what we've done here, which is questions and so forth from the council, and then eventually audience participation. So, Darcy. Thank you. I'm pleased to be introducing my first piece of legislation, which you can see in your packets. Uh, the motion and committee charge of an Amherst Energy and Climate Resilience Committee, which I've worked on in collaboration with Evan Ross, as opposed to Councillor Ross. A sustainability committee for Amherst has been on the drawing board for more than a year now, and the new town council has been looking forward to forming such a committee as a very exciting and positive act of unity in the new year. It's been very gratifying to work with a council president, town manager, and town staff who deeply understand the importance of prioritizing climate action. As we all know, climate change is a global emergency. This year, we've had major wake-up calls reminding us that we need to act locally and we need to act now to curb its long-lasting and devastating effects. The 2018 UN International Panel on Climate Change report underlined the impacts of exceeding global warming of one and a half degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. The report says in the starkest possible terms that humans have at most 12 years to fix their addiction to fossil fuels and drastically reduce carbon emissions if we're to have any chance of staying below that goal. It's very exciting that almost 50 members of Congress, including our own Congressman Jim McGovern, have signed on to support the idea of a Green New Deal, an aggressive new jobs program to, to move the United States to a renewable energy economy within 10 years. However, it's unlikely that a Green New Deal bill will be passed by the current Congress or signed by the President. In action at the state and federal level on bold climate proposals highlights a need for local action. Amherst has a history of recognizing the challenge presented by climate change, and the town will be providing a presentation about the sustainability initiatives it has spearheaded over the last two decades. So though the town has accomplished much, we do have a long way uh, to achieve our ambitious climate action goals. Over the past six years, I've been volunteering around the state working to get climate action going. I've worked closely with Climate Action Now, Mothers Out Front, the Sierra Club, Environment Mass, and top legislative leaders on moving climate action forward. This has allowed me to meet other advocates from all over the state and to find out what those advocates are doing in their communities. What I've found out is that Amherst has some catching up to do. For example, Watertown is the first town in Massachusetts to require solar on new commercial buildings. Salem, Newton, and Framingham are some, town, some of the towns putting solar on municipal buildings and parking lots. Newton is on track to supply almost half of its energy locally on schools, libraries, and other municipal land and buildings. Our own UMass now has solar canopies on two parking lots and panels on buildings. Some towns are transitioning their fleets to electric. Lowell has three wind power facilities in addition to its nine public solar facilities. Over 140 municipalities have authorized community choice energy, 
with many of those choosing to green their supply through the purchase of more renewable energy. Cambridge is one of the most bike-friendly cities in the, in the country. Northampton has implemented a program called Button Up Northampton, where volunteers canvas door to door to educate homeowners and renters about energy efficiency and conservation and how to transition to the use of heat pumps at low cost under a Green Communities Grant. Communities that have the most vibrant programs have a combination of these three elements. A motivated mayor or town manager, a sustainability director or manager, and a citizen-driven climate action or sustainability committee. Amherst needs to join these cities and towns by establishing itself as a municipal energy and climate leader and by doing it now. Let's not delay, let's make this discussion the last step in the process that will result in a vote on January 28th in support of a new committee that will drive climate action in Amherst. Evan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Darcy, for your comments highlighting the important need for this committee and providing some of the larger context in which we begin this discussion. Uh, I'll use my time uh, instead to speak to the process through which we came to this committee, uh, the focus and scope of the committee, and also my hope for how we might proceed. Uh, so the draft in your packet, uh, as Darcy mentioned, is the end result of a long process that began prior to this council being seated. Uh, such a committee has been suggested by our town manager and town staff uh, long before Councillor uh, Darcy. Uh, and I picked it up, uh, and I want to thank uh, them for their efforts and their commitment to making Amherst a more environmentally sustainable place. Uh, the current charge, though, further represents countless hours of work by several players. Uh, over the past month, Councillor Dumont and I have revised and refined this proposal together with each sub uh, successive draft uh, substantively, di substantively different from the previous. Uh, we also met with our council president several times, uh, our town manager, our assistant town manager, and our sustainability coordinator. Uh, in every meeting, each collaborator came uh, with their own vision of what this committee should do and should look like, uh, and we worked to find common ground and produce a proposal that included everyone's ideas uh, to, and intent uh, to a practicable, practicable extent. Uh, the result is a proposal that looks different from, certainly different from the original draft uh, that Darcy and I promulgated, uh, and also different from the proposal that uh, Town Manager Balkman put before the select board, uh, I believe last February. Uh, so as such, this charge is the result of negotiation, collaboration, and compromise, uh, and I'm proud of the work that went into it uh, and the process through which we arrived at it. I also want to speak to the focus and scope of this committee. Um, I believe the, the scope and focus of this committee fits our current moment. Uh, in the past, Darcy mentioned several reports, but in the past two weeks, the Baker administration released two other fairly groundbreaking reports. One is the Massachusetts Comprehensive Energy Plan, uh, and the other is the lengthy two-volume report released by the Commission uh, on the Future of Transportation. Uh, and these two reports set some fairly uh, ambitious climate and energy recommendations for the Commonwealth. Above them, and I'll just read a few, uh, quote, to promote fuel switching in the thermal sector from more expensive higher carbon fuels to lower cost lower carbon fuels. Uh, quote, address the split incentive, this is going to be particularly important here, uh, between landlords and renters for investments in energy efficiency. Uh, quote, enable and promote a ubiquitous electric charging infrastructure. And quote, make all current and future critical state and municipal transportation infrastructure resilient to a changing climate. Uh, meeting these goals necessarily requires action at both the state and the local level uh, and necessitates municipal planning and prioritization. Uh, this committee, with its focus on climate mitigation and building climate resilience, uh, will help establish the necessary structural uh, support for Amherst to partner with the state uh, to play its requisite part in moving the Commonwealth towards these goals. Uh, second, the climate focus charge of this committee provides the body with a clear mission and trajectory forward. Uh, while sustainability is an oft-used buzzword, uh, its borderless nature means that it can be difficult for the public to conceptualize uh, an end goal for sustainability. Uh, that makes long-term planning and prioritization difficult and also makes, uh, leaves us susceptible to misprioritizing and losing focus. 
uh, as someone who's worked for years in some capacity in environmental protection and conservation, uh, I've often felt the frustration of a public that is uh, enamored with contemporary sustainability fads at the expense of more important but sometimes unglamorous work. Uh, with a focus charge that commits this committee in assisting the town towards a carbon neutrality goal, and with a complementary focus on building our town's resilience to climate change, uh, the public will see not only the means of the committee, uh, but also the ends to which the committee is working and understand how these actions fit into a larger path forward. Uh, I believe this focused mission is important and would caution against diluting it. Uh, finally, I also want to emphasize that while the scope of simply climate and energy uh, may seem narrow at the surface, the work of this committee will be anything but. Uh, because so much of our society is tied to the combustion of fossil fuels, uh, and because so many aspects of our town affairs will be impacted by climate change, uh, the charge of this committee permeates throughout the various sectors of town. Climate mitigation is more than just solar panels. It also requires tackling demand uh, and, and tackling our transportation uh, and building paradigms. Climate resilience is even broader. Uh, it involves questions like, can our stormwater infrastructure handle a future with more intense pr uh, precipitation? Uh, can our farming community adjust to more erratic climate and changing climate zones? Um, can, can our vulnerable populations withstand increased cooling costs from more persistent uh, and frequent heat waves? Uh, so in many ways, this committee's charge extends beyond the traditional definitions of sustainability uh, and necessarily incorporates all sectors and communities of our town. Uh, it also means that this charge if, of this committee is a heavy lift um, and it will require a committee that is proactive, focused, uh, well-equipped, and inclusive. Last, I just want to give my hopes for moving forward. Uh, putting together this charge has been an exciting, if uh, laborious, uh, process. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, all sides made concessions, and I believe we have crafted a charge that finds a, a good balance between being prescriptive yet flexible, uh, ambitious yet rational, action-oriented yet prudent. Uh, so tonight's discussion, I hope, will serve as this final step. I'm looking forward to hearing comments from my colleagues uh, who have had a chance to read through this, uh, and also from the public, uh, so that we can take on board those comments, uh, make some final revisions, and bring back an amended charge uh, for a vote next meeting. Um, so I thank you, and I, I look forward to hearing your comments and also fielding any questions uh, that you have regarding this charge. Okay. We're going to go on and have the town make their presentation, but thank you both, Darcy and Evan, for your comments and your introduction of this very important issue. Mr. Bachman. Thank you. Um, well, we are all the town, so town staff that this, right. make this presentation, and I appreciate uh, the two counselors um, very thoughtful and articulate remarks for bringing it uh, to the public. Uh, nearly a year ago, uh, this uh, issue came up and the select board began to consider it and then with the change of government, recognized that it was a pretty large uh, undertaking by the town and felt it was inappropriate for the select board at that time to take it on as a major commitment from the town uh, in anticipation of the change of government. So I'm really thrilled that it's come back up as, a, one of the, as probably the first major initiative of the town council. Um, it's really important for the town council, uh, Darcy talked about different roles, but I think for our community, the town council um, weighing in, uh, debating, considering uh, uh, this initiative is probably the most important thing. You are the elected leaders of the community. You are the ones who have to set the standard and the goals for where you want the town to go. Uh, staff is charged with uh, making, working to make sure we can get there. Our job with you is to say what's achievable. Uh, your job is to say this is the direction we want to go. And so we look for you forward to your direction as, if you agree that this is the direction you'd like the town to go in. Um, I'm not going to talk anymore because uh, we have our assistant town manager, David Zomack, and our sustainability co coordinator, Stephanie Ciccarello here. They're, and we just have a few slides that we want to go through to give some background on where we've been so you know as you start to consider us where, where we should be going. Thank you. Please. Thank you very much. I'm Dave, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dave Zomack. I'm the assistant town manager. Um, I also have as part of my title the director of conservation and development. And I think that's very uh, appropriate to just mention tonight because many of the departments within the town that are involved with planning, uh, master plan efforts, uh, inspections and building in town as well as conservation and sustainability are all housed in the doors behind us here uh, to the south of this building on the second floor and all of those staff members including Stephanie and myself all collaborate together so I think that's kind of a theme that 
Uh, what Stephanie does and what we're talking about tonight really, as mentioned earlier uh, by the two council members, uh, needs to be infused and, and um, uh, part of everything we do in town. Um, I'm joined this evening by Stephanie Ciccarello. Stephanie has worked for the town for many, many years in conservation, and in 2016, her position was made uh, full-time and given the title of sustainability coordinator. Um, prior to that, she worked on a number of different initiatives as our wetlands administrator. I'll let her talk about uh, the various things that, uh, initiatives that she's been involved with through the years. She's well known and respected by her colleagues here in the Valley as well as uh, in the Commonwealth. Um, and as I said before, uh, where Stephanie sits within planning, within inspections, affords her the opportunity to work with staff, engineers and DPWs, our schools, our facilities department, uh, as well as various local and regional energy and sustainability related nonprofits and groups. So we're looking forward to working with all of you. We're work looking forward to uh, working with the many people behind us that support these uh, efforts and many people at home. Um, we're excited about this initiative. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to Stephanie uh, so she can talk more specifically about uh, what we've done and uh, where we hope to work with you moving forward. Good evening, um, Council President and Council Members, particularly thank you, Council Members Dumont and Ross, for your work on this initiative. Um, I'd like to just go over uh, a history of the work that at least I've been involved in since I've, I've been with the town since 1997. The work that I began uh, doing on this initiative was probably starting in around 2000. Um, the town of Amherst made a commitment to join an organization uh, uh, called ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability. Uh, the name used to be an acronym for something, but now it's just kind of an odd name. But they have a wonderful program called the Cities for Climate Protection Program, which launched us into looking at our greenhouse gas emissions and looking at the issue of climate change. And part of the charge when the, um, the town convened an ad hoc committee, energy task force committee, uh, was to, one of the charges was to put together a climate action plan. So the action plan was released in 2005, and what we discovered was that really our emissions, if you look at our 1997, uh, is our baseline year for that greenhouse gas emissions inventory that was done. Um, most of the, of the um, emissions, this is like the entire community, so including, you know, town government, institutions, um, industry. Um, the government portion was fairly small compared to the community at large. The community sector, as I said, is here, um, represents residential, commercial, industrial. Of course, industrial we have very little, so it's a very, very small portion. Um, but the largest um, piece of our pie here is actually the commercial, which includes the institutions of higher education. The town shifted its focus um, in 2012 when the Green Communities Program became available in the state. The Green Communities Program launched in 2010. And it was an opportunity for communities to focus on the municipal side and energy efficiency, but it came with um, funding tied to it so that communities were able to receive grants to actually implement energy efficiency projects. And this was a real game changer, actually, for many communities within the Commonwealth, because when you create these climate action plans and you identify these initiatives, they, of course, come very often with a price tag. So this was an opportunity for the town to get funding to actually do some of the, these efficiency projects, which ultimately, although it's focused on energy efficiency, really is moving towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions, because that is one of the primary ways in which we deal with reducing our greenhouse gas emissions is to increase energy efficiency and reduce energy usage. So one of our very first projects and the first um, grant that we got was for um, an LED streetlight retrofit. And the total project cost for this was um, ha about half a million dollars. With the Green Communities funding, we got 302,000 for our very first grant. And then tied to the utility incentive, 
nearly three quarters of the project cost was covered either in Green Communities Grant funding um, and with the utility incentive funding. So that the town portion, although seeming fairly sizable, um, we were able to do a project that actually yield a pretty fairly um, quick in return on investment because the estimated annual cost savings was roughly about 48000 once the project was implemented. So the, the emissions are important, but also one of the things about the Green Communities Program that has been um, really a, a driver for a lot of communities is the fact that it's also tied with um, cost savings as well, in, in addition to energy savings. Um, we used 2011 as our baseline year for the environmental, uh, I'm sorry, the energy reduction plan that we created as part of the Green Communities application. That is a, the Green Communities application is really a, a five milestone or five, um, uh, five milestone process that you have to basically achieve in order to, um, to become a green community. So one of those things was to create um, to pass the stretch energy code, and another was to create an energy reduction plan. So the five-year energy reduction plan used 2011 as our baseline year. And when we looked at our, um, we created a new greenhouse gas emissions inventory in 2017, we used 2011 as our baseline year and then compared it to 2016. Um, and we saw that when we looked at the community-wide greenhouse gas emissions, really, um, you know, we really hadn't seen uh, m much change uh, in the community-wide sector, whereas when we look at the municipal um, greenhouse gas emissions, we did see some, some fairly sizable reduction. Um, but again, you know, we're looking at um, a heavy lift with greenhouse gas emissions reductions because it's, an, it's not enough to just say, well, look, we're, we're doing this and that's great. We really need to continue. Um, and when we look at what's happening um, kind of not even nationwide, but even globally, the, the bar is higher now. We're looking more at carbon neutrality. It used to be just to sort of reduce our emissions by a certain percentage by a certain year. Really, a, a big a big lofty goal now is to really try to achieve carbon neutrality. So as I mentioned, the um, municipal reductions between FY 2011 and 2016 were fairly sizable, but if we're looking at carbon neutrality, you know, that's a much loftier goal if that is the direction we go in. Um, and those kinds of projections are still something that really need to be examined and looked at. So as this council makes their decision and creates a committee and the committee moves forward, these are things that we have to consider is what would be our target, what target, what would be our year for our target, and these are things that we'd have to, goals that we would have to set. So this is a very quick um, <laughs> a summary slide, a quick thumbnail of what are some of the more major initiatives that have been implemented since uh, 2000, the year 2000 when we really started work in earnest on reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. And um, the town pretty much focused on partners, partnerships and programs uh, with the utility, with other nonprofits. Um, then we looked at our municipal, um, our municipal efficiency, are the things that we actually implemented through green communities um, and other specific projects. So these are the, the actually projects that have been driven. Um, the solar landfill, I will mention it because um, it has not gone away. That project really is moving forward. Um, we're making progress. We're um, just about to uh, fully execute our revised power purchase agreement, so we're all very excited to see that um, project continue. In the transportation sector, we are, we've had a, a number of initiatives. Um, as mentioned, you know, greening the fleet is certainly um, something that we would strive to do. And we've purchased two electric vehicles. We've installed three dual head um, electric vehicle charging stations. And as many of you, I'm, I hope, have noticed over this past year, we launched Valley Bike Share, which has now given us um, a bike share program where people can actually 
uh, use bicycles, um, which are electric assist bicycles, to help them with some of their um, short, quick errands instead of getting in a vehicle and driving. And we are noticing that actually Amherst has um, been one of the largest users, users of the entire network um, in the valley because of UMass, a lot of the students are actually using, um, heavily using the, this program. So that's really exciting um, for, uh, for us and I think for our community and speaks a lot to what we're doing. And then when we look at, you know, sort of your role in the bylaw and resolutions that we've had over time, um, since 2000, several of these initiatives have been, um, this legislation has been passed within the community that has moved, you know, moved us forward towards these goals. Um, some of them have been town driven, some of them have been driven by advocacy groups, and some of them by um, individual residents. So there are initiatives that really have been um, moving us in the direction, but again, as mentioned, you know, we still have a ways to go. And when I started this work back in 2000, um, the predictions of where we would be with climate change, there were, you know, there was sort of a, a um, you know, the best case scenario, the medium case scenario, and then the worst case scenario. Sadly, we're at a worst case scenario in time. And so we're, we're, really, we're really at a point where we need to look forward um, and do things more aggressively because this does have a direct impact on the residents and our community. Um, and we look forward to working with you and moving this work forward. Okay. Um. We're going to move now to the council uh, discussion. Uh, and while I, um, I'm sure there's additional questions about what any of the speakers have made or any of the uh, programs going on with the town, I'm going to imagine that most of the conversation will be around the, by the uh, actual draft for the committee charge. But councilors, please, your questions, your Points of clarification. Mandy Jo. I'll start. Um, the title of the committee is Energy and Climate Resilience. And in doing a whole bunch of reading that you guys, thank you for providing all of those links about the issue. Um, it seemed to me in reading the charge that there wasn't a lot of resilience in the charge. So can you speak to, there weren't goals for resilience that the committee has to come back with. It was, it was in there as you can if you want for the resilience part, the, the part of, say, dealing with stormwater drainage, as you mentioned, Evan, or if there's excess water, the agriculture part, which for this town is huge. If we're going to get 60 some inches of rain every year, like we just did, that that's a, some sort of thing we, we're going to have to deal with in this town. And I didn't see that in the, in the charges as much as the title implied. So can you talk to, you know, can you talk about where that would be and, and what the thoughts are on that? I could uh, start off on that. Um, the, the charge does mention, in addition to climate mitigation, adaptation. So. Um, I think we wanted to um, um, include that in the title. Um, it is also a concept that comes out, out um, uh, is referred to repeatedly uh, in climate, uh, community choice energy uh, as one of the benefits, and that is a direction that we hope that we're going in. Um, so, and it, we, we did hear that some counselors m were confused about whether it meant the climate is being resilient, but that is not what it means. <laughs> um, so, do you have more to add to that, Evan? Evan, yes. So, um, resilience really, uh, there are no resilience goals. Um, and I, my short answer to that is I'm not quite sure what specific resilience goals uh, would look like, uh, whereas it's, it's fairly easy to say emissions are something that are uh, calculable. And you can say, OK, we want emissions reductions at this percentage or at this rate. Um, 
percentage of energy uh, supplied by renewables. Uh, that's, in, that's something that you can actually set a goal for. Uh, resilience is a bit harder. Um, I would argue that resilience is, uh, I may take this statement back after I say it, but that resilience is less goal setting and more planning. Um, and so looking at the charge, uh, resilience really appears in two places. Uh, one would be 3B, uh, which is that the uh, purpose of the committee would be in part to uh, recommend to either the town council or the town manager, whoever has jurisdiction, uh, actions to implement um, uh, anything that builds climate resilience. And so. Um, the, the assumption being that some of what the committee would do would be to work on mitigation, um, but it would also be recommending policies programs um, that would also work towards uh, resilience. The other part of that would be under uh, 5A, which is plan and prioritize cross-sector efforts to reduce Amherst greenhouse gas, em gas emissions and build climate resilience. Uh, so the word resilience may seem like it does not appear that often in the charge, uh, but it is tied to what I would argue are the two most significant uh, actions of the committee, which is one, promulgating uh, new policies and programs that it would recommend, uh, and two, sort of long-term planning. Uh, at this stage, uh, I think that the planning is probably a bigger part of resilience, um, and something could come after that, uh, and, and perhaps uh, our, our sustainability coordinator can speak a bit, bit more to um, uh, what that looks like, you can look to Northampton for what they've done for resilience planning, uh, but that would be the first step before you could really set any type of goals, whereas we already have a 2005 climate action plan that talked about emissions reduction, so a lot of that groundwork has already been done. Questions? Yes. Steve. So, Madam President Lynn had asked us to <laughs> send her individual comments, so I, I thought that I might um, share some of my comments. And so first, I think that, you know, kudos. I mean, I think this committee is very much needed. And so really my concerns are not so much about the need for such a committee, but some other issues. Namely, there's a staggering list of boards and committees in Amherst. Some are required by um, Mass General Law, some are required by the Charter. So really the coordination with those other committees. So a lot of what you're describing regarding resilience is planning. And we have a planning board who is also very focused on you know, these issues within its jurisdiction. So how, so, so I guess I become concerned about um, boards and committees that are perhaps even working at odds with each other are working not coordinated with each other. So one of the suggestions I had forwarded to Lynn was of the membership, perhaps some of those members should be people who are on other committees. So we have two counselors proposed and then seven others, but perhaps some of those seven others can be, say, a representative from the blank. Um, the other one were sort of nitpicky comments. So a lot of greenhouse gas concerns have to do obviously with architecture, with buildings, and so you would address that with net zero buildings and energy efficient retrofits. But there's a bigger part to the puzzle, which is people that can understand sort of the community implications of all of this. Someone who can connect the dots between say net zero buildings, because there's a upside to net zero buildings and a downside. The downside that it favors certain kinds of sites and certain kinds of buildings. So not every building is easy to be um, net zero energy, net zero water. But someone who can sort of help evaluate, the committee evaluate what the holistic goals for the community are, I think are very important in choosing membership. And so maybe one last comment before I, <laughs> before I forget what I had written to you was, it's not clear who actually choose the, chooses the members. So we say that these shall be the members, but I don't think it says anywhere who, or maybe I missed it, who the appointing authority is. There you go. Town Council, okay. I stand corrected. That's why I said it. <laughs> Andy. Well, first of all, I want to um, thank the counselors who worked so hard on putting this together and getting us started in this conversation in its newest chapter. Um, as a member of the select board, 
I was one of the people who was involved in this discussion quite a bit um, over the past year and was in, uh, part of the decision to say this is really too big for the select board to responsibly make this step for the town and to postpone it until we had a council. And so I'm pleased we're here and I'm pleased we're taking it up as a first issue. Um, there were several observations that I made about it, um, and I hope that we can keep moving on this. And um, so my observations are meant to um, stimulate the discussion in the next stage so that we can still come back and on the schedule that we're talking about and get this done. One is um, that reading the um, draft of the char committee charge and comparing it to all of the other committee charges that I have worked with over the years in my various capacities with the town, um, this is by far the most detailed and specific of committee charges that I think that I have seen. And we all received a compendium of current committee charges um, that was put together by um, Select Board Chair Slaughter for us to consider. And in comparing those, I think that you'll um, be able to understand what I'm meaning by that. Um, one of the reasons to not be overly specific in a charge um, is you don't want to be too prescriptive for a committee as far as what its duties are, and you don't want to set up a committee charge that needs to be constantly reviewed and revised. Um, it's something that needs to have um, a living capacity to it. So that's issue number one. Issue number two is that in my role as a select board member, we had liaisons to committee and I was liaison to the re uh, Recycling and Refuse Management Committee. And that committee was doing a lot of very good thinking and good work around issues that also relate to sustainability. And um, the, one, they have put forth um, a refuse management plan that uh, is in need of a lot of work towards implementation. And I've learned a lot about that, uh, about the whole role of committees working towards implementation through my work with that committee. Uh, the uh, problem that I see coming forward uh, is that um, I don't want to see the two committees competing with each other, and I don't want to see um, the committees, by being two committees, eating up resources. As uh, uh, Steve said a couple of minutes ago, we have an awful lot of committees in this town, and uh, the original thought was to have a sustainability committee that would contain both of these issues, and uh, Part of the reasoning and the thinking behind that was not to create yet another committee that requires more staff time and um, more of um, our time as a council to oversee yet, yet, yet another committee, but to try and revise the committee and expand the committee's goal and role. Um, and uh, that thought process has been lost in this, and uh, we, if we did this, then the question comes in is what happens with the um, goal um, for the refuse management plan. And then the final thing that I wanted to just touch on is that uh, we, we talked about the uh, carbon neutrality as a goal, as an end goal. <clears throat> and I'm not sure where that sits. And that was similar to something that came up with the refuse management plan. Was zero waste the goal in an aspirational sense? In other words, we wanted to work towards it and get as close to achieving zero waste, or did we believe we really could achieve zero waste? And um, I think that the same thing applies when you talk about carbon neutrality. And uh, I, it, it's just something that absolutely needs clarification because the impact on the town, on our residents, on our institutions, and on our businesses is tremendous if we put forward uh, requirements 
through implement, trying to implement a goal that's an absolute goal that have a high cost on, on them. And um, it makes me a little bit nervous because we would be doing this as a matter of adopting a uh, committee charge as opposed to the much more complex process of adopting a bylaw and there hasn't been the opportunity for community discussion and input on what um, the benefits are of this goal and what, on the other hand, might be the costs. So I hope that over the next couple of weeks as we assign this to a committee, that that committee can um, sort of explore some of these questions. Okay. Yes, Mandy Jo. There are requests from both Kathy and Shalini to speak. Okay, Kathy. I'm just, uh, is, is my voice the right volume? It's very loud. This is Kathy. It's very loud. Voice of God. Oh, speak lower. Okay, I, I don't want to come across as shouting, I can whisper. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I want to build on the, some of the comments on the need to be thinking cross-sector and cross our committees is attempting to do, and it's quite exciting, the talking about emissions. One of the slides talked about how much of it comes from cars and uh, transportation and buses. And we don't really have a cross-cutting set of planning issues around roads and around development that says, what if we could get out of our cars and be walking more or be riding in electric buses or have sidewalks uh, where people could get back and forth to school. Um, a vision of uh, not using cars or using electric buses. And I, I think trying to weave a few of these things in linking to other committees would be very helpful because they tend to act in silos. So I, I think I'll just stop there because it is this sense of not it's not so much that we have lots of committees, but the committees don't talk to each other and come up with an overall vision. And I think it's really important. And I might just mention I'm calling in from an old European city. And what I'm struck with is the number of people who are walking everywhere, riding their bicycles, and taking buses. And cars just aren't there, and the air is cleaner. Um, you can really sense how much the emissions that are coming, that would normally be coming out, just aren't there. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, Shalini? Shalini, make sure you're off mute. Oh, yes. OK. okay. <laughs> so, is my sound OK? Yep. Yes. Okay, so yeah, I'm continuing with this theme of uh, uh, the intersectionality. And uh, so what I would like to see more of in the proposal is how are we going from the goals? Uh, well, firstly, the goals to expand them to include the different dimensions, such as social, economic, cultural, environmental, um, or whatever way we decide, because when you think of resilience, again, it's cross-sectional, and it's impacting different aspects of our town, so the goals need to reflect that. And as an example, if we had transportation as one of the areas where we set our goals, as Kathy also mentioned, that would determine our, you know, it would influence our funding priorities as well. If that indeed is our goal. Um, so instead of where do we put our money, do we first fix the potholes or do we ensure that we have bike lanes and sidewalks? So, you know, just making sure that we are um, thinking broadly this, uh, what our goals are in terms of resilience. And then the to get from our goals to um, the outcomes, I'm seeing there are programs and policies. What I'm not seeing is strategies or the strategic vision uh, 
to lay that out more clearly so that, again, we are including all the different sectors, we're including all the different communities, the vulnerable po populations, and uh, the different sectors. So um, having more of a, uh, a comprehensive plan and a roadmap that takes us from our goals to the end. And then the programs and policies become more the action items rather than the st strategic vision. And the third part of that is in terms of the membership of the committee, because it's impacting um, different cross-sections of, uh, of our community, including um, the different committees that already exist, the transportation, businesses, UMass being a big contributor, um, uh, or businesses to have their buy-in and to understand the unique challenges that each stakeholder or each uh, community is encountering, I feel the representation in this particular committee should uh, take into account all these different voices and their perspectives. Thank you. Thank you. Other counselors? Yes, Evan. Just to uh, lightly respond to, to some of, um, just to point out a few things. Um, so uh, five uh, B and C has to do with the committee uh, working alongside relevant multiple member bodies and also coordinate, uh, 5C, the text is coordinate with other multiple member bodies, Tom departments, businesses, and residents, regional organizations, and the university of colleges, uh, university and colleges, uh, with the intent there being to have some of that uh, interaction between uh, committees that the counselor, sorry, that Kathy uh, suggested and also get at that intersectionality that Shalini uh, brought up. Uh, also, just to point out for uh, B, uh, in the conduct of its work, the committee may propose uh, strategic options and incentives. Uh, I believe that speaks perhaps a little bit to what Shalini brought up about going beyond programs and policies and looking at uh, strategy, uh, and that's specifically looking at strategy to <coughs> overcome uh, some of the many barriers to implementation that we may find uh, financial and otherwise. Okay. Other comments? Darcy? Uh, I'd just like to add to that that the, the, the town uh, is already engaged in a, in a process uh, called the vulnerability assessment. And it will, it will be conducting, um, getting community input on uh, our vulnerability to climate impacts. Maybe you could talk about that a little bit, Stephanie? Um, yes, the town received uh, a grant. This was um, a, a pre-charter effort where the town uh, secured a grant uh, through the state for 29,000 for technical assistance uh, to um, participate in the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program. This is uh, kind of a, um, a very formulaic program where communities across the Commonwealth are encouraged to look at their vulner vulnerabilities in the face of climate change. And so the first part is a planning process um, and um, you will hear more about this in the coming month, uh, but the, the town will put together um, uh, two stakeholder meetings in which many, a broad spectrum of the, of the community will be invited to attend and to look at identifying what our vulnerabilities are to climate change. So for instance, there will be um, obviously representatives from each of the institutions, but also those within the business community, um, those with work with our more vulnerable uh, members uh, of the community as well. And everyone will be gathered and um, broken out into groups and will be able to identify our vulnerabilities. And then the second part of the process is to then have a second meeting with the same stakeholders where we identify some kind of action. And then from that process, there will then be a community listening session in which everybody in the community is invited to attend. And uh, more feedback is gathered from that process and then that's all put together in a report that is then provided to the town where it identifies the vulnerabilities and also some of the steps to take action. Um, but it also makes a recommendation for um, a next, sort of a next phase. So for instance, 
um, you know, depending on how things uh, pan out within the stakeholder meetings, um, there may be some recommendation, for instance, to put together um, a climate action plan or a resiliency plan. So that will be um, spelled out in that, in that um, report. And then that allows us and opens us up to the ability to apply for an action grant where we can actually then implement some of the actions that were identified in the report. Thank you. Other council comments? Yes, Dorothy. Um, I just want to say thank you to um, Darcy and Evan for all the work they did. I think this is an incredible document and I think it's wonderful that the town of Amherst has been active in this area uh, for really a long time and that I'm hoping that we can move forward quickly because time is running out. Thank you. Sarah, excuse me. Sarah? Hard to follow that up. <laughs> I was just going to make a point to um, the fact that we're talking about different committees and whether they would or would not be working against each other. I think the way that this committee is set up is it's, I don't think that it's, its charges are too broad, but I feel like it brings together a lot of the, um, the things that other committees are trying to work toward. So I feel like instead of other committees, you know, fighting against this or not being heard, I think especially when we're bringing up membership and bringing in other committees, I think it's a chance for, um, like say, the Refuse Committee. And also I'd like to say the Ag Commission because farming and us being able to feed ourselves is huge. You know, you, if you can't feed yourself, then the lights might be on, the heat might be on, but you might not be there for very long. Um, but I see that these smaller, well, they're not smaller, but the, the committees that are smaller that are working on specific goals would then be able to do extra work for this committee, and then no one would be lost. Everyone would actually be working towards more immediate goals together. Are there other comments? Yes, George. Yeah, I have uh, two, uh, one specific question concerning, uh, sorry. Uh, actually, two questions. The first uh, has to do with the, uh, in 1A, um, the uh, request that the committee set a date certain for um, two very specific goals, both in uh, 1A1 and 1A2. I wonder if you could just address that a bit. It seems like uh, within 90 days for them to uh, set a date certain for uh, achieving carbon neutrality. Um, given all the complexities and multiple factors involved. Is that an aspirational? Uh, what's the thinking behind that first? My first uh, just question. Darcy or Evan, which one? I think that um, the uh, goal that most uh, states and cities have been looking at up until now is uh, a date by by which they would become carbon neutral, and the 2050 is the date that's commonly looked to. So, but we were not, uh, we didn't want to be prescriptive, so we wanted to give the, the committee the opportunity to decide uh, what date. Some communities have come up with a, a, a date that's sooner than that. Um, the the New legislation, the 100% renewable legislation, uh, has also set out an interim goal uh, by which communities could become 100% renewable electricity. And the goal there is to, to get um, towns and the state to electrify their heating and um, their building and transportation sectors, um, and then um, if they set a goal for 100% renewable electricity, that actually gets the bulk of the work done by that date. And the, in the state legislation, that date is 2035. So um, there are uh, towns now that are setting these final dates and interim dates, um, and some setting annual dates in order to be able to fulfill their end, end goals. Uh, so uh, it's, I think that it would be not that difficult to look at what other communities have done um, and the process that they've gone through. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, and, 
it wouldn't be that hard to come up with our goals. Additional comment? Yes. Uh, Darcy said most of what I would have said. Uh, I think the key points here, because it does seem like a fairly short span of time and they do seem like significant goals, uh, one of which is uh, this is uh, perhaps one of the areas that Amherst uh, is slightly behind on and that uh, there are many other communities that have gone through this process. And so I think that there's a lot to model on. Uh, the, the, the other question, which is sort of unaddressed, which uh, Andy brought up, uh, earlier is whether or not these goals uh, should be viewed as aspirational or absolute. Um, and, and I want to speak uh, on behalf of myself and not on behalf of, of Darcy here because we haven't had this discussion. Uh, but to some extent, I don't think that was uh, within uh, our uh, scope of work to determine um, because we wanted to uh, give the committee the the work and the responsibility but also the ownership of what these goals look like um, and so I think that uh, how these goals should be interpreted what those dates are uh, that should be the work of a committee that is obviously broader than just uh, Darcy and myself sitting in a room um, keeping in mind of course the recommendations that they put forth for these goals will uh, by the design of this charge come before the council, and so the council would have another chance uh, to ask the committee whether or not those goals are aspirational or absolute and what their reasoning is behind that. So this will not be the last discussion on these goals. Andy Jo. Shalini has another question. Shalini. Um, I think one of the other things I wanted to add uh, to the charge, even though it's mentioned in 4E, that the committee may propose to town council funding opportunities, I think that should be an important part and um, that this committee should be doing is looking at the funding and revolving loans and all of these different options to make it feasible for the different communities to adopt these uh, goals. Okay. Yes, Alyssa. Thank you. Thank you. And I do not actually have comments because they've already been made associated with the content in terms of all the good things we're trying to do. I, I have some comments about the mechanics. And I think probably the best way for me to do that is to submit through the chair a restructuring just simply of how this looks. All the meaty parts in the middle, no worries, those aren't being changed. It's just the part about where things fall in the charge document. This doesn't look much like any of our previous charge documents. It's a new kind of charge document, and that's great because we should be doing new things, but it's also, I think, hard for the public to follow. For example, composition of the committee should be right at the beginning, should be right after the headings. It shouldn't be something you have to wait till the end of the second page to read. Because if you're looking at this online, which I hope people would, they would say, oh, I could be part of that because I could be one of the seven members. Oh, it's a town council standing committee that's only got three town councilors on it. Oh, well, then I'm not going to be part of that committee. And they can move on to the next charge. Um, simple things like that. But I did have a couple of substantive concerns associated with membership. And I don't know how much of that was assumptions based on what we might do or was strongly felt commitments from the people who drafted this. I didn't see any reason at all to put a staff member on the committee. Non-voting, voting completely doesn't make any sense to me to have a staff member on the committee. Um, staff support should always be assigned by the town manager, but having an actual staff member voting or non-voting did not seem relevant at all. Um, there's a good deal of confusion based on the way the references are set up in terms of who is doing the appointment. And I believe, based on all the accompanying material we received and what we heard tonight, that this is intended, as I would have hoped, as a standing committee of the town council. Therefore, as a standing committee of the town council, it's appointed by the town council. It's got nothing to do with town manager appointments. So that section would be removed associated with that, assuming that we then have a conversation later about how town councilors are normally appointed by the president to town council standing committees. We haven't yet had a situation, as we will also have with our finance committee, where other members of that standing committee need to be appointed 
one assumes, by the council, because the charter says we can appoint standing committees. It doesn't say, oh, anybody who's not a councilor gets appointed by the town manager. So therefore, I would, we would just want to clean that up. But if there are any particular, as I you know, have this reoriented, if there are any particular rationales that people still feel strongly about in terms of having a staff member on the committee or having the town manager report. There's also some wording in here that I think may simply be due to unfamiliarity with committee charges in our existing uh, committee appointment handbook that talk about electing a chair and a vice chair. We don't have to talk about that in this. Um, that talk about serving for a three-year term. We don't talk about that. We do need to talk about if somebody thinks it's important whether or not counselors themselves, the two of the nine, can serve as chair and vice chair because that's called seems to be addressed in here in a confusing fashion. And so I think we need to straighten some of those things out so that once I have it in a different format, it would actually have the words in it you want to. Thank you. Other comments? Yes, Mandy Joe. So I'm gonna build on what Alyssa just commented on on a couple of things. Um, I was also confused as to whether this was intended to be a standing committee of the council, appointed under 260, as it said, or a committee of the town in general. Um, one of that confusions, I think, was the fact that I've always thought of committees of the council as having a majority of councilors on it than residents on it, and this one does not yet. So, so I, I'm, I think we need to clarify which the intention is. Is it a committee similar to the recycling and refuse or you know, transportation committee or these other committees that are town committees, or is it intended as a committee of the council? Um, Membership-wise, I've agreed with most what everyone said on membership. I think it's extremely important on a committee like this to have a mm, representative from UMass in reading all that we were given, given the fact that UMass's emissions represent approximately 42% of our total town's emissions, we're not going to be able to accomplish any goals we set without their complete cooperation. Um, and so, I know they have their own climate action plan, but if they don't meet theirs, we're likely not gonna meet whatever we got because they're half of our emissions. And so I think we need to relook at the membership portion. Um, and then I, there were two parts of the charge that talked about the committee itself requesting funding for the committee's operation. And I wanted some background from the individuals who proposed it on what you had in mind when putting that particular issue into the charge. And then, you know, because I'm myself not familiar necessarily with any committees themselves actually formally having a mechanism to request funding for their operations aside, outside of just the town manager doing it. Most committees don't operate with funds specifically assigned to them, I don't believe, someone correct me if I'm wrong, so I'd like to hear about that because it is one thing that does concern me about the current charge. One of the things that we uh, would possibly be asking for funding for uh, would be, uh, and it, it, this is just possible because we, it's possible also to get grant funding for some things, uh, would be to write a climate action plan. Uh, it's possible that we would need a consultant to help with that, or, uh, but it's also possible that it could get grant funded. So um, that's just one possibility. Evan. Evan. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just to, to clarify at least my uh, personal vision, because as I read this, I could see maybe where you were confused, uh, or, or you could get confused, is that it, it does sort of read as if the committee has its own working budget, perhaps, that it would request, uh, which was not necessarily my thought. My thought was that there were actions that this committee may recommend uh, that would require uh, some type of appropriation from the town, uh, and that it would uh, have the authority to ask the town for that money. Um, but I would not expect this committee uh, to sort of come and say, uh, here's our operating budget. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Other questions? Yes, Steve. Yeah, so I, I guess I saw this committee as being for 01002 as opposed to 01003 UMass because I think UMass has its own sort of fully formed approach to these exact issues. And I think by including them as, say, equal partners or whatever mm -hmm. as into our efforts, in a way, muddies the waters. In other words, I think that this should almost be, you know, almost outside of UMass, in fact, outside of maybe even the other educational institutions, how we can, you know, approach these problems, these, these very real problems. The other thing is the committee of the town council versus committee of the town is a confusing one. So I saw this as a committee of, of the town, never, never of the town council. But someone will have to explain to me exactly what the difference is. OK. Other questions? Pat. Going back to Chalonet's comment about intersectionality, et cetera, there are a couple of places that talk about uh, environmental justice communities and reaching out to them. And I think that's important to look at. But that brings me to a question of membership of the council. Um, we're talking about experts in, in all of these particular areas. I would like to see some people who are um, <laughs> experts in how they are impacted by the, by the decisions of this committee so that they're, they can be part of the um, collaborative process of reaching some kind of consensus um, to support the goals across the community and the costs across the community. Other comments from the council? Okay. Uh, we are going to move to public comment. Could I see a show of hands of the number of people who would like to speak? One, two, three, four, five. All right, we'll go with the number five, and given that, we'll ask that you keep your comments to three minutes. Uh, I do want to say in advance of that, I do not hear from the council anybody who is opposed to moving forward in this direction. So the uh, comments that we really need to hear from the audience are things that help us think about how to structure and move forward. Um, you're looking at 13 people who uh, I think are very anxious to see us move forward. So Russell, Vernon Jones. Okay, thank you. Thank you, I live at 17 Gaylord Street. Um, I think we do all know that climate change is a big and important issue, and it's not an exaggeration to refer to it as the climate crisis or the climate emergency. However, it can be really difficult to keep our attention on how dire the situation is for the whole world. And even more difficult to think that we can do something truly significant about it. So we know the bad news is that climate change is threatening to make our planet uninhabitable by human civilization as we know it. The good news is that we can do something about it. And third, there are vitally important things that we can do locally if we don't delay and put barriers in the process. The recent report of the UN Intergovernmental Panel Climate on climate change, the IPCC, makes it clear that the problem is worse than many had believed. That we as humans have 12 years to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 45%. That's an immense task, but it is possible. People in many parts of the world are already seeing catastrophic storms, agricultural disruption and starvation, deadly wildfires, the spread of diseases, and increasingly deadly conflicts. The report says that unless we move quickly 
to get off using oil and gas to heat our buildings, fuel our businesses, make electricity, move people and goods. In only 22 years, we will be seeing worldwide food supplies affected, flooding of coastal cities, fierce storms and fires, and huge numbers of climate refugees all seeking somewhere to live safely. This requires action everywhere. Every bit of emissions from everywhere in the world, including Amherst, makes the problem worse. Local action is particularly important right now in the United States because the action at the federal level is all in the wrong direction. What I find exciting is that we can participate in solving what may be the biggest crisis ever faced by our species. There is so much to figure out about how to make our town <coughs> carbon neutral. And you as the council will play a critical role, not just tonight, but in the, on, in the future. And if forming this committee with what I think is an excellent charge as it stands is an indispensable first step. Please do not delay. Thank you. Thank you. Additional hands? Yes. Hello. Is this all right? Uh, my name is Ayala Carter. I'm an Amherst native and currently a graduate student in business and public uh, policy administration at UMass. I am strongly in favor of the formation of the Sustainability Committee and that its formation and actions not be delayed. This is both because it is in the town's interest to pursue sustainability initiatives in a more organized and efficient manner and because it is in the interest of the citizens of Amherst uh, and surrounding communities for the town to be a leader in sustainability. The committee structure would be a considerable improvement over the way the town currently manages sustainability programs, and I'd like to illustrate for you why this is the case. Amherst is arguably better positioned than many other towns in the country to be a leader with respect to sustainability. We have a population that is both highly supportive of sustainability and willing to adjust their behavior to support green initiatives. Indeed, many town residents voted for their council members based on their positions on these issues. And crucially, our community has a greater density of scientists, engineers, policymakers, and activists who work on sustainability issues than almost anywhere else in the country. Amherst College, UMass, and Hampshire, and the individuals in their orbit give the town access to a nearly unrivaled body of experts and advocates who can help make these ambitious uh, projects a practicable, practicable reality. I would argue that we have a moral obligation as a community to take full advantage of all these resources to attempt to make innovative and meaningful progress with respect to sustainability and a committee structure that brought together elected officials and community members would certainly do so. UMass is home to the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, a federally supported organization. Their most recent conference at UMass, which I helped organize, drew over 50 practitioners and policymakers from around New England. While representatives from Boston, Burlington, Vermont, and Hartford, Connecticut were president, or present, sorry, representatives from Amherst were not. In addition, the schools are home to dozens of student-run organizations, such as the UMass Environmental Community Outreach Club and a chapter of the Sunrise Movement, which happened to be founded by a UMass uh, student, plus thousands of students, like those doing graduate work in sustainability or public policy, that are eager to engage in local sustainability projects. A committee structure would be able to take better advantage of this untapped community resource. We need a dedicated committee to undertake all the good work that the town can and should be doing with respect to sustainability. Sustainability initiatives, initiatives are wide ranging and complex. They cut across traditional lines of town bureaucracy and require stewardship over years and de decades. Work this complex and urgent requires more direct management and resources than the existing coordinator position is designed to provide. A committee such as the one being proposed will allow the town to efficiently manage its sustainability resources. Thank you. Thank you. I just would like to ask that, again, people speak to issues regarding the, the charge, the structure, 
Again, we're not here to be convinced. We are convinced. Additional speakers? Rudy. Okay. Here, push. Does that do it? Yep. Uh, hi, Rudy Perkins, District 2. Um, Madam Chair, to, to, I had other comments trying to convince you of the urgency of this, but I'll try to speak more directly to what you've asked about. But I do want to talk a little bit about the direct impacts on our town of climate change, because I... Oh, and it'll stay on. Great. Thank you. Um, you know, obviously our federal leaders have basically abandoned leadership on this and our town and many other towns are going to have to act urgently to uh, change the situation. Um, and we're going to have to act because this is going to directly affect our town, our kids, our grandkids. Um, in terms of our energy supply now, it's, uh, if you look at the fourth annual uh, climate assessment that was just released, the chapter on the Northeast, one of the things they focus on is how vulnerable our energy system is to climate disruption now. We have an interconnected uh, electricity grid and with coming uh, anticipated extra summer heat in the Northeast, it's going to put extra strain on our, our electrical systems in terms of air conditioning, water pumping and treating loads and so on and so forth. Most of our energy, the report, uh, points out most of our power is being generated by stations on the coast and our fuel facilities are often on the coast in the Northeast. So the New York City comments that the New York City power plants are only 16 feet above sea level in many cases and the Sandy storm surge was 14 feet. So when we talk about um, our town, we need to think about our own current energy vulnerability. Um, obviously, there's potential impact from climate refugees. We saw that with the 2017 climate-fueled hurricane in Puerto Rico and Maria. We had a lot of people coming to our valley that we had to scramble to take care of um, who were climate refugees. Um, our local farms have crops rotting in the field from too much rain and so forth. So le let me just talk a moment more about um, energy because I think as we plan for net zero buildings, for example, um, we have the opportunities to create better resilience for our communities. When I was doing some housing developments, I looked at the solar on our roofs that we were putting in and wanted to go an extra step to find out how that solar could power the building during power outages. We should be looking at things like this. The chart specifically talks about microgrids. That's another defensive measure where we might be able to go off grid with key municipal buildings. So I think a committee like this will be very useful in focusing the conversation both to urgent achievement, and 12 years is not very long, urgent achievement of, net neutra of carbon neutrality, and then developing more resiliency in how we plan our capital projects, how we increase our ability to grow food locally and so forth. Um, those are important things that this committee could weave together. But I, I would s suggest that this committee's focus stay on energy and climate, um, because I think if you add too many topics, it's not going to be able to achieve uh, the sort of incisive, urgent work we need on climate change. Um, so that's one point. And related to that, I think you need to have people who have expertise or commitment in this field as certainly the bulk of the committee. That's because you want to be able to get right up to speed um, right away and focus on what we need to do. There will be plenty of opportunities for community forum and for community meetings to get input from other sectors and the wide variety of opinions and populations in our town. But I think the, the core of the committee should be people who have expertise and experience in this area so that they, they, there's no learning curve. We get right on this. So that's probably more than three minutes. But it is, thank, thank you. you very much. Please, this gentleman. 
Hello, my name is John Root. I'm the chair of the Town of Amherst Recycling Refuse Management Committee. I've, I've already spoken with three members of the town council, and uh, I appreciate the, what the, the commitment that all of you do have. And I, uh, 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 Andy was, uh, as he mentioned, the liaison to our committee, uh, and uh, we we received uh, help uh, through the years on a number of issues. Uh, our major uh, accomplishments, I think, are the solid waste master plan that Andy referred to, uh, and. While we did have a couple of bans, you know, the polystyrene and the plastic bag ban, um, another major, uh, but that's that's important, but not that uh, not that impactful, I would say, in terms of the, the total amount. But the other thing that we've done is we've been able to uh, get the assistance through a grant and, and through matching funds uh, of of a town uh, waste reduction enforcement coordinator. She's going to be leaving in about six months. So we used to have the the support of a part-time uh, waste, uh, uh, excuse me, an, uh, uh, recycling coordinator, Susan Waite. She no, uh, she's now with Northampton full-time, and we have no one. We have no dedicated staff. So that was uh, one of uh, one of the items on our wish list. And I, I should say that that solid waste master plan was enthusiastically received by the select board. Um, but it was it was not a document that had that was a plan in the sense of uh, here's what we need to do first then next it was these are some excellent these are some ideas which the select board agreed were all good ideas but that's but it's stalled in in the water nothing's happened since and of course uh, uh, forces beyond a lot of people's control things have been in in flux and that sort of thing so I do want to uh, share some concerns that the members of our committee have in terms of what we would be able to do going forward uh, as you as you're aware. At this time, solid waste issues are not included in the charge of this committee. My concern about that is we have only four members at this time. Uh, we're supposed to have seven. That means that even to meet, all four of us have to get together. We've been doing virtually nothing. It's very difficult for, to even get them. And there's a, uh, if even one of us leaves, then, then our committee is defunct, and, and that's likely to happen fairly soon. I don't see a way forward to attract new members because the way we have always attracted members is by having a vibrant, you know, extant uh, meeting that people could come and visit and, and participate you know, and watch us work. So I, I don't see how, I, and, 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 I, and I did meet twice with Darcy about uh, talking about these issues, and I, and I again, I'm really a, a very deeply appreciative of, of the commitment of everyone here about these issues. Um, so I, uh, 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 and one thing that we discussed as a possibility if we weren't included was, well, could we have a, some kind of a citizen's initiative that could uh, get, uh, get going, you know, that would be an advisory just as much as a town committee? I don't know. I mean, that's a possibility, but I'm not real optimistic about that possibility. So uh, I, uh, I, I wish I could speak for much longer <laughs> about these issues, but um, one, one thing I did want to mention, for example, is there's a DLTA grant that we, uh, we were hoping, or I was hoping that the town would be able to apply for uh, by January 11th uh, to get a, a, a assistance from the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission to, uh, to create a zero waste master plan. And by the way, zero waste is aspirational, but if you look at a, a truck going down the highway uh, with, with refuse, almost all of that uh, is recyclable or, or should be kept out. So it, we, we really could do a lot of things. We really could have pay per bag, pay as you throw, which would be a, a, suddenly a, a dramatic decrease in, and other towns and municipalities have done this. So, and, and of course the organics and the, so all of these things, I have a concern and other members of the committee as well, how can we, how can those issues be addressed if we're not part of the next committee? Thank, Thank you. you. I believe we have one more comment. Yes. Hi, my name is Lenore Brick. I live on Strong Street. I've been deleting and editing because you know, <laughs> um, so what's left? Uh, I appreciate your support. I didn't think I'd have to convince the 2019 Town Council of Amherst about this. That would be horrible. <laughs> but, um, but I do urge you to think big. It's, it's scary to think big when, because your job is so much in the, in the weeds, in the details. But we have to think big, bigger than existing committees. 2050, 2035, those, those years were thrown out before the last IPCC report. Um, and, and to understand the 
great opportunity we have in Amherst, as, as the young woman said here earlier, because of our book and plowshares town. Um, we know about energy systems. We know they need to be updated and, uh, and adapted. But what some of us don't know is that even if we stop all the emissions, that it's not enough. <laughs> and that many scientists don't think carbon neutral is enough. That carbon neutrality is not the goal. That carbon negative is the goal. And to get to carbon negative, we need to not just be dealing with energy efficiency and renewables, but we need to be taking that carbon out of the atmosphere and sinking it into the land and the water. And what do we have in Western Mass that they don't have in Eastern Mass? In Boston, we have more land. We have farmers. We have educators. We, we are in this unbelievable opportunity. You people here in this little town of Amherst, we can do something really big. We can be a model for the state, for the nation, and beyond. This is, this is like, this is it. This is the real deal. We live in this very unlucky time, but we're lucky to be able to do this. And you also might not be aware, you know we have a strong climate action coalition here, but we have a new committee on our climate action coalition which is dedicated to terrestrial mitigation to carbon sequestration, to soil regeneration, to regenerative agriculture, um, to food systems, because photosynthesis is the way that the Earth has been doing this for 4.5 billion years until we got in the way. And so we have to take ancient systems and update the technology and update our will. And forest ecology, because trees are the unsung carbon sequestering superheroes of our planet. And we can do this, we can bring all our resources. This team that we've just put together has been working with local, sub starting to work with local subject experts. We have scientists, we have professors, we have educators right in our midst. They don't have to necessarily be on the climate committee, but they of course can counsel, they of course can advise. But I totally agree with Rudy that that committee has to be has to hit the ground running with expertise so that we're not like, you know, just catching up to understand the problems. So I would like to offer to the committee and to the town council this committee that we have just formed. We're in our infancy, but we have to grow fast just like you guys are in your infancy and have to grow fast. And I think that we can catch up together and use the resources we have um, in Amherst to do something uh, really great together. So, thank, thank you. you. One more. Push. No? Okay, got it. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I wanted to address address some very particular issues that the council needs to consider in establishing this committee. Um, the work of the committee will be um, overwhelming because of all the initiatives that are already in place. The uh, zero energy buildings um, are going to need to be monitored. Problems are going to come to this committee. Um, the Community Choice Energy Project is a, a major initiative that is going to be coming um, before this committee, and a lot of the details will have to be worked out there before it comes to the council. Um, and the municipal vulnerability um, planning will also, you know, these are things that are already going to be happening. We know of um, there's going to be many other initiatives that will come from the um, committee. It, it needs to stay focused. Um, and I urge the council to have this committee be the vehicle for uh, presenting issues um, concerning um, our, our waste system, but to have um, in, in, in have a citizens committee work out the details so that 
this committee can remain focused and move as swiftly as possible. So. Thank you. Let me uh, move forward by attempting to just create a couple summary remarks. Um, first of all, we want to recognize the, it, the extensive efforts that have already been made by the town and the expertise that resides there, as well as the expertise that resides on this council and in our community. Um, Amherst has um, made some progress, but clearly not enough, and we have a long way to go. Um, things that have been raised specifically about this committee include its membership, and I have to say that we've gotten different messages on that, uh, but we need to keep in mind how we coordinate, how we collaborate, and how we include other issues perhaps not mentioned at this point, including such as waste management. Um, a second thing was to the idea that we should expand, if you will, using the last speaker's, our second last speaker's role, think big. This is a huge commitment on the part of the council and the town and we wanna make sure we get it right. And at the same time, council members have raised the specificity in the charge and wondered whether or not we need to have the charge be broader but not as specific. Um, at the same time, we've had questions raised about the format, the structure, is it a committee of the council, is it a standing committee, is it a citizens committee, is it a combination? And um, we've had the issue raised about dollars, not just dollars for supporting the committee, including staff dollars, but also what kind of impact these kinds of initiatives have on individuals who live here in Amherst and do business here in Amherst. Um, I have to say, that's a lot. Um, and with that, I would like to suggest a motion and I'm looking for somebody to make that motion. I'm gonna go a little slower, and I've already had one council person suggest that in the future I would have a motion sheet, and we'll do that. Um, the, this would be to refer the proposed Energy and Climate Resilience Committee charge to the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee and ask that they, in consultation with the presenters of this draft charge, review the matter as expeditiously as possible and report on that progress and if possible, return to the council on January 28th with a recommendation for action regarding this matter. So moved, Pat, and a second, Steve Shriver. Is there, is there discussion? I'm sorry, the, Pat, I, Pat made the initial motion. I have them written down for you, too. Is there any further is, conversation? Is there, is there discussion? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, I understand that some issues need to be resolved in uh, finalizing the charge of this committee, but I think it could be done just with the people who uh, devised it and with Alyssa and a few other people because um, I'm just, there is no precedent for the other committees we have been forming at least the other standing committees to go have it go before the new governance committee. And so I'm just thinking that that might be, it might be an unnecessary obstacle at this point because I think that we aren't that far from having this charge in shape ready to go for the next meeting. Other comments, Sarah? I'd like to just add on to that and to say that I, I support that and I, I really don't, I don't know that we want to set a precedent that this would go to another committee right away, so I would, I would agree with um, Councilor Pam. Andy. I think we have to look at what we expected as the charge for the Governance Committee because the Governance Committee is really how we function and our committee structure is integral to how we function and therefore it seems that this is very much in the realm of that committee. And furthermore, um, given the breadth of the discussion that has happened this evening, 
Uh, I think that we would be benefiting by having larger group participating because I know, uh, or at least I'm quite confident, I don't know because I can never know, but I'm quite confident that the two people who brought the first draft to us will continue to participate as it goes before the second committee. Um, but that is why we created the committee. Darcy. Uh, I appreciate the intent of the motion, but I um, believe that the committee charge of the governance committee doesn't include reviewing committee charges. It, the issue, let me just speak to this, okay? Uh, the issue, there's two, two or three issues here. One is around the substance, and one of the issues of the substance is one of the reasons why I made the, or suggested the motion I did that include that this be done in consultation with you and Evan, okay? Because you really bring the substance, if you will. But uh, many of the issues that have been raised, as I think Andy has just pointed out, are really much about our organization and our structure and how we go forward. Is this a standing committee? What does a standing committee mean? And so, Therefore, the input of a group that is, in fact, charged to look at our governance, our structure, and our um, legislation is really the only committee I could see would be appropriate. Mandy Jo. So the charge of the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee includes advising the Council on matters of internal rules, governance, and organization. So the organization part would be standing committees. Um, and to review bylaws and resolu resolutions proposed for form, content, organization, sort of for the technical matter. Now that technically doesn't include in that wording um, standing committees. But there have been a number of technical issues, form issues and all of that that were mentioned tonight that, uh, about what has been proposed. So you know, I, I guess my thought is as we move forward and, and we've talked about these committees that we formed, that their charges might have to change too. Um, and I think there might even be a request for one of the charges to already be amended coming up later tonight. Um, but it makes the most sense to me to send a request to form a new subcommittee of the council to the committee that's charged with or reviewing internal organization of the council. Um, Stephen. So as has been said before, we're, we're building the airplane as we're flying it. So I think in a, in a, in a more <laughs> next year, this would have gone to a committee first before being presented to the full council, I would assume. But um, as was introduced, mm -hmm. I think when Councilor Dumont presented this, you said that this was, you, you know, your first piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. So I think that by by that concept alone, this is appropriate for referral to that committee. There's, the soonest we can act on this anyway is the next council meeting. I think mm -hmm. that the motion is in the spirit of voting on this at the next council meeting. Alyssa. Uh, maybe I volunteered for the wrong committee, but I don't, did not believe that that committee, the governance committee was going to be the one that was going to be looking at our charges because the people on that committee don't have any familiarity with our existing charges and how that might be done. And so I'm a little concerned about, I understand the substantive part of it and how in a different reality it might have gone to that committee first from the standpoint of conforming with the other things we haven't created yet. But um, I'm not, well, I mean, obviously I can send my edits to anybody I want, but I don't understand how I can accomplish a more global impact on the way charges are organized by suggesting it when we haven't yet even used our old charge form. So that confusion aside, I don't know if that means you want to just say that the people are getting together, that it's formally going to them, that I'm allowed to go talk to them. They're having a posted meeting, I presume, to do this. Um, this is all very new. 
And right. the governance committee was not talked about in great detail in terms of exactly what it would do. And I just am not clear. The other thing I wanted to ask about, completely on a side note, in terms of the substance that will be discussed by the, the original uh, designers, is the line along, I'm sorry, I have so many tabs open here, I'm not sure where it is anymore, but the line that talks about, it's in one of the sections that says shall, and it says shall assist in educating staff. Mm -hmm. And that makes me very uneasy. Mm -hmm. I don't think that belongs there, and I think that that's the kind of thing where if staff said, I would love if you would come with me to this thing, um, that would be entirely appropriate. Or to say to the town manager, why haven't you let us talk to such and such people? But having experienced a number of very highly functioning and very poorly functioning as well as mediocre functioning committees, when you find people see a thing that says shall and says shall educate town employees, they're real eager to go tell town employees what to do. And I don't think that was anybody's intention. I think it was just a cooperative effort. Evan. So, uh, a couple of things. Um, I, I, I do have some concerns. Uh, I think uh, the intent of the motion uh, would be to refer to committee uh, with the hope that this would be returned to the council for a vote by our next meeting on the 28th. Uh, that would be three weeks. Uh, this committee technically hasn't been appointed yet. I mean, it will <coughs> today, I think. Um, yes. But unlike, I think, the, the Station Road Bridge situation where it was referred to the Finance Committee with the expectation that they come back on the 28th, uh, we have had a Finance Committee before, and I think that that is a committee uh, that could get up and running very quickly. Uh, the Governance, Legislation, and Organization Committee, uh, I don't think will operate the same way. Uh, 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 Alyssa, I'm gonna, it's going to take me forever to get used to this first name thing. I hate it. Um, <laughs> Alyssa uh, mentioned... Thank you. I'm trying not to be too loud now. Um, that's too loud. Is it? Okay. All right. Um, so I think, you know, as Alyssa pointed out, uh, the discussion of that committee uh, ended with still some feelings of ambiguity. And so I think that that committee needs to be appointed, meet, figure out what it does and how it operates and what its procedures are and how it decides when something is ready to be recommended back to the full council. To me, that is weeks worth of work, if not more, of the committee just figuring out how it operates and at what point does the committee say, we've done our job and we send it back to the council. Um, considering that the majority of the comments from the council Sorry, Siri. Uh, the majority of the comments from the council have been substantive, and I would assume those would need to be addressed for, first because it doesn't make sense to address any uh, form and structure changes until you have all the content down on your page. It doesn't seem reasonable to me that we could make the substantive changes to the charge, get it to a committee that hasn't even been appointed yet, have them meet, and send it back to us by the 28th. And so if we realistically want to vote on this on the 28th, uh, I don't think we can send it to the committee. If as a council, we are okay with delaying a vote on this until what I assume would be late in February, um, or perhaps March, uh, then I think referring it to the committee is okay. Uh, but I, I personally don't think that uh, uh, three weeks is a reasonable timeline to do, make both substantive and structural changes if it has to go to this committee. Andy. I guess my concern is, is that if we um, send it back to the two people who drafted, who, um, and I appreciate both of your efforts, um, we're essentially creating you as a committee. And um, then we get into this whole question of how did that process take place. And for that reason, um, I have some hesitation. Uh, and I actually think that the governance committee uh, can build the airplane as it's flying it by taking on this um, very issue because I think it's going to go straight to the substantive discussion and uh, get to the task at hand 
and may learn about what airplane it needs to construct after it's done the first part of it. Steve. So our discussion tonight is a beta test of how this committee will work, and I think it's been very effective. So basically five out of the 13 here will be that committee, and if that first conversation of this committee is what, similar to what happened tonight, I think we're, we'll be good. And as a member of that, proposed member of that committee, I think, um, I'm completely confident that we can meet this January 28th deadline. Minus 48 hours. Dorothy. Well, I am most concerned about a precedent which I think is being formed and I think prematurely. Um, I do not think that I would like to have a legislative and governance committee which functions here in this small 13-member council like the Rules Committee uh, in Washington which becomes the, the boss of what happens. Nothing happens until it goes through that. And so it would be, in fact, that committee would become the chief executive committee of the council. And I don't think we need that structure. We're 13 people. I think we've been doing a good job of, of getting along and being reasonable. And um, I, I had, the way the charge, well, maybe I read it wrong, but when I read the charge for the governance committee, I thought, oh, they're gonna be concerned with rules and with regulations, not with what comes up for a vote or what the form it's gonna be before it comes in a vote. So that's my concern. I, I do trust this committee, at this, this council at this moment, to come together in a, a very speedy and efficient way to bring a good um, charge to us for our next meeting. I'm sure that that will happen. But I just want to say I think that we've got to watch that we don't, in our effort to do that, rush into setting a precedent that perhaps we don't want to set. Darcy? Again, I, I also, I agree with Dorothy. I don't think this should be a precedent that we set uh, of sending matters uh, such as a committee charge to this committee. Um, and I'm also concerned uh, that um, Andy was uh, saying that the committee would be um, dealing with the substance of the suggested changes because that was also not the intent of this committee. Andy, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I wasn't referring to the substance, but I was referring very specifically to how you structure and word things. And where I think it maybe the analogy is, is that when you get a bylaw proposal, you have to, in the end, make sure that it is appropriately worded, consistent with um, common uh, practice of structuring bylaws so this is clear and understandable, I would hope that this committee focuses on that aspect of it and not what the uh, specific intent is of the um, proposer. Um, it, it, but I think we'll be in a very difficult position if we, as a council, um, are receiving proposed bylaws and other actions that have wording in them that have not been vetted through just common uh, drafting, uh, legislative drafting kinds of rules. And DJ. So I have a comment and then Kathy has requested okay. to speak. Um, I am concerned with Evan's seeming um, argument that the draft of the charge should not go through a technical review to a committee that we assigned for technical reviews of items that come to this council. I think that sends a bad precedent of avoiding and circumventing an exact structure we three weeks ago said we wanted. That as, as Andy said, we wanted a group of counselors on this governance committee to review items for technical compliance with other bylaws, with our rules of structure and with things like that. There have been a number of technical items that have been brought up tonight as to whether it complies with things like the charter, um, what item under the charter it's being appointed under, things like that, um, our regular charge 
documents and how we set out the charges, none of that, that's all technical. Um, there's a number of technical things that I didn't even bring up tonight because I figured it was going to someone that would be dealing with technical matters. Um, to take an action tonight that says, yeah, there's technical actions, but we're just gonna skip the committee that is charged with dealing with that. I think that's a really bad precedent for how we're going to deal with other bylaws that come, other resolutions that come, other charges that people might want to propose. I think we need to send this to that committee prior to it coming back here for a vote, whether that means the substantive issues need sent to an ad hoc committee that might include Evan and Darcy and maybe some other counselors, and then they send after substantive changes that charge on to that proposed substantive change on to this governance committee for some technical look at it to make it look like and comply with our regular charge documents. Maybe that's what we need to do, send it to two different committees, one in sort of succession, substantive review, then technical review after the substance has been changed based on our conversations tonight, and the goal being that it still come back on the 28th. I don't think there's a necessity that it needs to be delayed if we as counselors are going to, if we believe that this is that important that it needs to be done that quickly, maybe we as counselors need to find the time in the next three weeks to make those two reviews happen. Steve. Yeah, so I definitely, this has to be sent to somebody. This has to be sent to somebody for review. So the choice, do we send it back to the sponsors? I think that um, it's a decision of the whole council and I think that the sponsors put the ball in play, but I think that the group that reviews it has to be larger than the two sponsors. And so we can make up a work group that includes the two sponsors Thank and you. three other counselors, but we have that committee which is called the Legislation Committee Evan's on it, so we are guaranteed the representative there. Um, all the committee meeting members are on it, assuming that we approve it. Um, committee member meetings are open to everyone, so uh, Council, uh, uh, Darcy would be, of course, if she's not on it, welcome to attend. I don't see what the issue is. I think we need to trust, trust our instincts, and to me, this is exactly what should be happening, that this should be referred. The ball's been put in play, and now it should be sent to this group that we have created to review these kinds of things. Uh, I forgot to call back and call, uh, call on Kathy. I'm sorry. That's okay. Sorry, Kathy. Hi, I, I only partly heard what Steve was saying. His voice, among others, breaks up. I think he might have been saying what I was going to say, but can both Dorsey and Evan be hard, part of whether we call it ad hoc, but the talking about specific places where it's minor wording change to be compliant with some format. And so far as I can see, we don't have a common format yet. It keeps evolving, but at least so it makes sense to people. So is there something rather than them just giving up a document that has a lot of content to it to somebody else being part of ad hoc, a working group to get uh, changes in before it goes through some formal piece. And then my second question was, if we have like a specific sentence in it or a place where we think it could be clearer, do we send those in as suggested edits or just questions? And do, who do we send them to? Do we send them to Darcy and Evan, just so they separately get people's reading comments on that? I'm not sure how we handle it as a process. Okay, let me first address the hotness and also just sending in specifics. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Uh, first of all, uh, let me go back to the charge as I read it, uh, to the motion, excuse me, the motion, and that was to say that it go to this committee and ask that they, in consultation with the presenters, Evan is already on, up, appointed to that committee, Darcy would clearly be welcome. It's a public meeting because it has to be a public meeting, and my concern is that there were some really seriously substantive 
issues about the format of this. Is it a standing committee? Is it a citizens committee? What is it? And if we sit here as a full council on the 28th and that hasn't been more thoroughly vetted by a smaller group of people, we will be sitting here trying to resolve some of those kinds of issues. And that's what subcommittees or standing committees are for. And I'm not looking for more structure than um, we need, already have, but I am looking for the most judicious use of the council's time and how we try to move things like this forward. So in terms of your second question, Kathy, I would assume that that committee and Darcy and Evan would want all of the possible comments they could get. Pat. Um, someone mentioned go mm -hmm, thank you. Someone mentioned going with instinct, um, and my instinct is a little bit different than the way the motion is listed or the way you're presenting it now, Lynn. Uh, it was in uh, collaboration or, or with the, or in consultation with the presenters, yet we're talking about Darcy being a guest. She wouldn't be a guest. She's one of the presenters. I also think we could, Evan is on the committee that uh, we have issues around a com committee appointments, that, so we don't even know if the committee is going to make it through tonight. I hope it does. Um, but I think that we could create very quickly an ad hoc committee with Darcy and Evan and maybe one other person from the legislation, legislation uh, governance thing so that we can get this done um, by the 28th. I think it's going to pass. I, you know, it seems a little bit um, wasteful of time to spend this much time um, on something that can be simplified right now. Alyssa? I think the thing that we all have to sit with some level of discomfort over, especially me, obviously, in this case, is that the five people who are appointed, which hasn't even been publicly announced, to an extremely short, extremely imprecise charge mm -hmm. that I, frankly, never considered committee charges was included in, um, are going to be able to have a more productive conversation than the 13 of us are going to be able to have. And so if that committee had been in existence for two years and this came up and we sent it to them, then yeah, that would be so obvious. And so I don't want to mess up a new precedent either, but I understand people's level, including my own, of uneasiness with making it feel like some people are guests at a committee and some people aren't really full participants and when are they going to meet and is that going to actually be a time that these petitioners can actually be there, et cetera, et cetera. So I understand why people are super confused and I guess I'm encouraging us to not worry too much that at this very, if it does end up going to this committee, that this committee will not sit there and decide, oh, so shall we follow what Alyssa thinks a committee charge should look like or what Brookline thinks a committee, let's just not do that, let's just fix this thing yeah. so that this thing right. can be ready and I'm reflecting back to something Steve said earlier, right. we can fly this plane this time, right. see how that goes, that'll teach us a lot about the process, but I would beg that we make sure that when that committee that hasn't formally been announced um, actually meets for the first time more than 48 hours from now, that they be really cautious to include the people who have said they need to be included so that they meet at a time they can be there. And then just maybe it'll take one meeting and some email and then it'll be ready for the 28th. Okay. Call a question. It's a roll call vote because we are in a situation with two counselors not actually in the room. So I'll have the town clerk call the roll. We want to start with our two remote participants. 
Councillor Shane. Councillor Shane. I, if I understand what I'm voting on, I'm voting to. In, I just want to repeat what I think I'm voting on. I'm voting to include the two authors with a group that will fine tune this wording wise, and we all send them our comments. If that's what I'm voting on, I say yes. Okay, I'm repeating the motion. Okay to refer the proposed Energy and Climate Resilience Committee charge to the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee and ask that they, in consultation, we could also say in, in a, including with the presenters of this draft charge, review the matter as expeditiously as possible and return to the Council on January 28, 2019 with a recommendation for action regarding this matter. Okay, with the, with the amendment to say including them, then I vote yes. All right, so it's a friendly amendment, and it's going to say including the presenters of this draft charge. Okay. Councillor Balmill? Yes, I would, yes. Councillor DeAngelis? No. Councillor Dumont? No. Councillor Greismer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? No. Councillor Ross? I abstain. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? No. Councillor Brewer? So the vote is eight in favor, four opposed, one abstention. Okay. All right. Moving on. We still have a couple other items. Um, the first of which is an action item discuss, dis, regarding multiple member bodies, and it is to look at the charge for two committees. One is the committee for the Resident Advisory Committee. Do I hear a motion? Remember, we have to have a motion and a second before we can discuss. Oh, I, I so approve. move. It, this is a motion to approve the charge for the Resident Advisory Committee. I, I would, uh, yes, I move that we approve the charge for the Resident Advisory Committee. Second. Okay, did you get that? The second was Steve. Uh, discussion, please. Alyssa. I would be voting against this charge at this time. I do not feel it's at all clear based on how open meeting law works and on how advisory bodies to, it's a very long story, but based on how open meeting law works, I don't see how this committee can function properly without some additional information. I wrote a ridiculously long email to the town manager today asking about that, and I believe we need some additional legal counsel. It does, it literally does not make sense with the okay. way open meeting law works if we want it, depending on what we want it to do. Okay. Mandy Jo. Um, so I had two comments, one of which actually relates to what Alyssa just said. The first one was the chart, the one-year terms. Um, I think the charter might, depending on how this is considered, whether it's considered a multiple member body or not, might require three-year staggered terms, not one-year terms. So we would need to figure that out. Um, but number two is, under the authority, it says the charter, which is true, the charter requires the town manager to establish do we even have any authority to deal with this charge at all? Because the charter says the town manager is to establish this resident advisory committee. Do we even have authority? Mr. Bauckham. Uh, thank you. 
Uh, the reason I put it in is because it was a, a committee that was called for in the charter. And so it's, it's an item that was called for in the charter as opposed to an initiative of the town manager. I thought it was um, okay to bring it to you, but if the, tr if the council says, this is your committee, it advises you, you set it up, you determine how it gets uh, um, carried forward, I totally would, could buy that. But in terms of being conservative in my interpretation of the charter, my sense was to bring it to the full council. Thank you. Alyssa. I'm extremely happy to have the town manager be very conservative on this field because I agree that it is probably not within our purview to discuss this, except we need to figure out how charges work. And that was why he generously included this and has done so throughout the last while that there have been town manager appointments that have not necessarily required a charge to be approved by anyone, but it's more a matter of does this make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. And um, not that it's, it's more of a working together cooperative thing so that we can learn from each other in our charges rather than because we actually literally have any say. One of the reasons I would prefer that the town manager not go forward with it as it is without some additional clarification from our town attorney is I want to be able to convince people to be part of it understanding what their role can technically be. And I believe that, unfortunately, the way it is written in the charter puts us in a difficult bind that way. Okay. Mandy Jo. So I actually just want to bring up a comment on behalf of the remote participants. They are repeatedly saying some of us are breaking up. I think it depends on whether we're close or far away from our mic. Thank so you. if everyone could try to stay close to the mic. Thank you. Other comments, Pat? Uh, yes, um, I'm going to. I have two things to say. One, if this is a residence advisory committee, uh, Mr. Bockelman, I'm confused by we would why we would limit it to three people, three residents, uh, since the community is so complex. Uh, my other question is the draft. It says committee charge. I think that we need to send this to the legislature governance. Uh, committee that's forming because it is poorly written and uh, it's not clear whether we have authority from the charter or not. So what we did with the last uh, charge should move forward with this. We should move forward in the same way with this one. Other comments? Do you want to make your statement as a motion? Pat. Yes. Yep. And I'm I, sorry, Steve. Well, there's a motion and a second on them. I'll that's second that's true. I'm may. sorry. Yes. There is so a motion and a second. Vote that so that withdraw that. Right? Uh, the motion and the second is to approve the charge. And um, let me call that question. Well, the motion withdrawer could withdraw. No, she can make the motion over that, please. Thank you. I'm making a motion to refer the charge to the um, committee. To the uh, on governance and legislation. Right. Uh, is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further conversation on that? All those in favor? Yeah. We have to do a roll call vote. The two remote participants? Yes, from Kathy. Yes, Shalini. Okay. Councillor Dumont? No. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. <laughs> Councillor Greismer? Me. I'm sorry. Councillor Greismer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shriver? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? No. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. The vote is 11 to 2. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, we now move on to the coordinating, budget coordinating group. Again, this is a charge. Do I hear a motion to approve? I'll move to approve. A second. Second. Um, Council Ross seconded it. Schreiber. Are there comments, questions? Yes, Alyssa. I'm happy to go ahead and vote on it. This one is actually straightforward, but could we ensure that the governance takes a look at modifying the actual document to make it look like the others that we're inventing as we go along? Yes, so in other words, we would approve it, but refer it for formatting, okay. Um, I'm just trying to clarify what Alyssa said. Are there other comments? I can amend my motion to state what you just said. Okay, so that we will approve it with future yeah. formatting changes. A referral to the Committee on Governance for formatting? No, wait a minute, no. There's two questions here. One is, are we going to approve this? The second is, do we agree that it needs to have some additional formatting? And the, so the question is, do we feel we can approve it without that formatting change and then have it formatted and brought back as information? Yes, Steve. I think a motion that says I move to approve with a later referral to the Committee on Governance for formatting, would that serve the trick? No, you don't like that, okay. I, I'm looking at the town clerk and trying to figure out <laughs> just how far afield we've moved. I'm sorry, I moved away from the mic. Um, we're not appointing to this committee tonight. Right? We are not appointing to this committee tonight. Then I would suggest we refer. Yes. Um, I think I, I just did get confirmation. Kathy would like Kathy to make a comment. Yes. Yeah, I just um, I'm fine with uh, referring. I just have uh, two comments that I know we're uh, Lynn that we're trying to clear up. Um, we have two different kinds of committees in the charter. One is committees that are subcommittees of the council and others are committees that have council members on them and others on it. Um, and it's just, uh, when we say it's a standing committee, they're, they're different. So when we refer to the governance committee, maybe we can clarify whether we should say standing committee of the town, standing committee of the council, or something to differentiate them because they are different in terms of their composition and their role in the town. So I'm fine with referring it, but those were my two questions about um, the appointing authority being, and trying to define what kind of committee it is. Right, and I, I believe that that's consistent with some other people's concerns. Okay. So are there any other comments on this? The, the motion before us now is to refer this to the governance organization and by and by law committee. Yes, Mandy Jo. The charge as written that we're likely to be referring, I believe, um, does not have a number of counselor representatives listed in there because the charge itself leaves it up just just leaves up the whole membership to the various bodies. So I wonder would that if we leave it like that would we then need another action to determine how many representatives? Do we want to put that number in the charge itself? Do we want to leave it as a separate action for a later time? So in other words, as you were saying, unlike other committee charges where we've designated the number of counselors, this does not designate, and do we want that to be in this charge, or at least convey that now as we send it for referral. 
Well, when you appointed two people from the council it to does, it, you yeah. could just add the number two in this charge. Um, that uh, those appointments are not going to full, go forward right, tonight. Right, right. But that looked like a decision had been made. I don't think I would have made that one up. So somewhere okay. along the line, I think I we did say two. Yes. So our finance committee charge refers to not more than two on BCG, but I don't believe we ever, as a council, decided whether we wanted non-finance committee members and how many onto the budget coordinating group. I, but I believe that's probably why Lynn had potentially suggested yep. finance committee membership for that right. committee. Yes, Pat. I'm going to say that I'm a Pisces, which means I swim in two directions simultaneously. I feel like we're setting a precedent here that I'm getting more and more uncomfortable with. We have um, made decisions in the last three meetings mm -hmm. about committees and charges and, and, thing, and now everything seems to be being referred to the governance committee. What we've done previously is to make corrections and discuss whether we want two or seven or nine or 15 or one. Um, so I'm, I'm a little hesitant to just say, let's refer this, because we could do that with everything tonight, and I'd get home earlier, but I don't think that would be a good job. Right. Um, I think, just to clarify, it does seem that there are other issues with this as to whether or not it's a standing committee, a standing committee, or what, or whatever. But the issue that was raised was the way that we wrote the finance committee charge it has two people on this committee, but we never discussed in relationship to this committee whether or not there should be non-finance committee people on it, which we did do when we talked J about JCPC. Steve, did you? No. Oh. Okay. You've got a good um, so right now, based on the um, finance committee charge, there are two people from the finance committee that would be on this. Is there a desire for any other representation on this? I'm not hearing a preference from anybody. Mandy Jo. Mm, I'll speak to it at least <laughs> since I brought okay. it up. Um, I, you know, I hadn't thought about it much before this committee. It's just before tonight and this conversation. Um, but I think given what this group is likely to be charged with doing and is what it is charged with in the charter, I don't know if there's a need for non-finance committee members to be on it. It's a group that coordinates sort of global budgeting guidelines, which is what our finance committee is charged you know, in terms of budget. That's where they're charged. So I'm not sure we have a need to have non-finance committee members on it. Right. I did think we should at least talk about it, though. Are there other comments regarding the number of members on the committee being to finance or anyone else? Any other counselors, I mean. And personally, on my, ba my knowledge of what this committee deals with, it seems like the two finance people would be adequate. All right, so we're, I'm, we would add that because it is already in one of our charges. I guess I, I guess I guess I need a little bit of clarity. I'm trying to interpret what my notes say from the 17th, and it looks like we're mostly talking about two, and we're mostly talking about just all the things. And in fact, you were quoted extensively in my notes, Ms. Haneke. Um, but, uh, when we say finance committee, I think we need to be really specific. There are going to be a bunch of finance committee members that aren't town councilors. So we're not putting non-town, are we putting non-town councilor finance committee members Thank on you. BCG? Yeah. Or are we putting town council finance committee members on BCG? 
It would be that to needs town to be council. Clear. It would be to town council finance committee members. Okay, and that is basically dictated by the finance committee charge we already passed. Okay, so that's not even really an amendment, it's just being clear. Now the question before the committee is, do we refer this or do we approve it? Right now the motion on the table is to approve. Approve. Alyssa. I really, under, I, I do think I'm sympathetic to the idea we're not referring everything, but literally the titles are wrong. I mean, it's just, it's just bad formatting. So the formatting just needs to be fixed, but the content doesn't need to be fixed. There are some slight content things that need to be dealt with in the energy committee. This doesn't have any content issue other than making sure it's clear on the two. It's just the, word, the, the titles are wrong. So I'm fine with even saying we approve it, but knowing that someday governance is going to There might be it. some editorial pieces to it. Okay, so the motion is on the table to approve. Is there any further discussion? Evan. But would the motion also have to include that second part? Would this essentially be a, a contingent approval? Uh, no? No. No, it would be a regular approval. And then just understand that there are edits, and in fact, there's edits that have to be done on all of our charges. Exactly. Even the ones that we have already passed. It's format issues. It's how do we regularly format everything we do, which I know is near and dear to your heart. <laughs> um, yes, Mandy Jones. So I, I, given that I think Evan and I are on this committee, so I think we're trying to figure out what you're going to be asking us to do with this after we approve it. So is is the thing not to necessarily bring back in a week? The wording's all good, and and the goal is at some point we're going to this committee is probably going to come up with a standard format for charges, and when that happens, this is one that needs to come back. Is that is that? that that is well. Is, is that well? All of them would be redone. Are they going to need reapproved at that no. time? No. It's it's a standard formatting. It's not it. It's not changing the intent or anything else. In fact, we could do it as a consensus vote. <coughs> it has been observed by several people that the formatting of the different charges have been different and we're trying, Alyssa and I have had a back and forth exchange on this very issue uh, this week and looking at trying to come up with a standard format and in fact, our style guide. Yes. Yes, and along those lines, I really think that we can just not, I mean, I'm very dedicated to saying things like we voted on this on such and such a date and that needs to be recorded on the charge. But this is not the kind of revision that changes the content of the right. vote. It's literally headings and does composition appear at the beginning or at the end. Right. It is not changing any of the words. Okay. Any further questions? Clarification? Call the question. It has to be a roll call vote. Uh, Councillor Baumill. Have we amended it to say that it has oh, to? It, do, it does now say, by virtue of it already being in a different charge for the Finance Committee, that it will have two town councillors from the Finance Committee appointed to this committee. From the town finance. Town council. Two town councillors from the town finance committee. I think so. Okay, we're ready for the call a question. The roll call vote. Kathy says yes. Shane. Shalini, yes. So our two remote people have said yes. Councillor Greismer. Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pan? 
Yes. Councilor Ross. Yes. Councilor Ryan. Yes. Councilor Schreiber. Yes. Councilor Steinberg. Yes. Councilor Swartz. Yes. Councilor Brewer. Yes. Councilor DeAngelis. Yes. Councilor Dumont. Yes. It's unanimous. Okay. Oh. Yes, we would like, there's been a request for a break. Five minutes. Okay, our next item is the town manager's report. Is there a highlight or two that you'd like to share with us? Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Lynn. <laughs> I know we're hitting the, we're almost at 10 o'clock, which is your, your witching hour. Um, we're past that. There, yes. Yeah. Um, the, one major thing I'd like to note is uh, things that had not been in, several things that I had in my list to mention were already mentioned. One thing I do want to mention is that uh, our own Nancy Eddy will be recognized as one of the, as the founder of the Massachusetts Municipal Association at the MMA annual meeting on January 18th. I would encourage um, us all, whoever's going to be there, to uh, get to the opening session early, which I think starts at 9.30 or 9.45. Yeah. Um, get there early because it's the most crowded session of the day. Seating is at a premium. That we, I'll try to get there early and we can reserve some seats at the very front. She'll be seated in the front of the room. I think it'd be great for her to have a contingent of Amherst folks sitting with her. Um, whether she, I don't know if she's going to speak or anything or if they're just going to recognize her as being the very first president of the Mass Municipal Association, which is a really impressive feat. And she was featured, if you haven't, in tonight's packet, you have a, the Beacon, which is the, um, uh, the newsletter, the monthly newsletter from the MMA, and there's a full uh, page, page and a half article about Nancy in there, which is really great. Um, uh, a he uh, just a heads up in terms of what's coming up uh, at your next meeting on January 28th, among other, the other things that will be coming back to the council, uh, will be a presentation on the North Common uh, Main Street parking lot proposal that was last presented to the select board back in September or October. Um, this will be presented to you as a first item, as a first look for you, so we can start the conversation about whether it's something you want to start to pursue or not. And um, that's all I have for tonight. Thank oh, you. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. And the re your report has some very other interesting highlights. Mm -hmm. uh, we're moving on to, to a two-part thing on appointments. The first is the president's appointments to standing committees. Um, those committees, in fact, have been approved. They're the Finance Committee, the Communication, Outreach, and Appointments Committee, and our committee appointments committee and the governance organization and legislation committee. Um, the, um, I have uh, included in your packet a memo and it actually names the people to these committees. Um, just very quickly, finance committee are Andrew, Andy Steinberg, Kathy Schoen, Lynn Griesmer, Pam, Dorothy Pam, and Shalini Bellman to the Communications Outreach and Appointments uh, Committee um, is Alyssa Brewer, Sarah Schwartz, George Ryan, Evan Ross, Darcy Dumont, and to the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee, although some wish they had not volunteered for this, we have Mandy Jo Haneke, um, Pat DeAngelis, George uh, Ryan, Evan Ross, and Steve Schreiber. Um, can I also just say that this was done by my sending out a poll and asking people to express their first, second, and third choice. And some people have expressed that they would like to also be on the committee that has still not been named and described, nor a charge passed for it. And that will be one of the subjects at our retreat. This particular um, item does not require any action. I hope you're all happy with your appointments. Moving on. <laughs> If you're not, you'll let me know. <laughs> Believe me, I know that. Okay. Uh, the uh, next item is, in fact, being removed from the agenda. That is the appointment of town council members to multiple member bodies. Uh, this became a question mark in some people's minds as to what was the appropriate uh, role for the 
president of the council, and since this is a precedent-setting council, uh, we I decided to ask for a um, town attorney to review this in relationship to the charter. We have not received their advice yet, and it won't act on this until such time. So 8B is not being acted on at this time. Any questions on that? All right. Um, however, the town manager has provided us with a list of people to be confirmed for the count for the board of license commissioners. And let me just state, and Andy or Alyssa, you are certainly welcome to add to this, and that is the charge for this committee, I believe, was approved in the past by the select board. By this yes. committee? Yes. By the okay. council? Right. Uh, Mr. Bachman, would you like to speak to the appointments? Uh, yes. Um, so this, for the Board of License Commissioners, the council approved the charge in, your, in December, December 17th, I believe it was. Um, and, and according to the charter, um, I am to refer to you the names of um, people who I desire to appoint as members of the Board of License Commissioners, which I've done today. I've also simultaneously, as required by the charter, filed it with the town clerk's office. Uh, the, the five people I've um, referred to you is Douglas Slaughter, five Dwight Circle for a three-year term, Gaston De Los Reyes, 45 Canton Avenue, and Marion Walker, 106 North Whitney Street for a two-year term, Hallie Hughes of 30 Orchard Street, and Robert Paul Musgrave of 20 Rolling Green Drive for one-year term, two, two people for a one-year term. The memo from the town manager does describe the process by which these people were applied and were appointed. Is there any question about that? This does require a motion to confirm by the council. If it does not, if we do not confirm, it, we have 30 days to confirm. And uh, if we let that expire, it's automatic. Um, yes. Move that uh, we confirm the appointments recommended by the town manager. Is there a second? Second. D'Angelo, Pat D'Angelo seconded. Any comment? Mandy Jo. I actually think we should refer this to our appointments committee since we have an appointments committee that is supposed to review the multi-member body appointments made by the town manager. So I actually move to refer to the appointments committee. Is there a second? Second. Okay. And uh, further discussion on that? Alyssa. You can ask for it, but if you don't look up, then nobody can I'm give sorry, any. I'm sorry, Alyssa. Go ahead. <laughs> I know you have thousands of pieces of paper there. Um, I would, much as I'm finding refer a dirty word tonight. Um, I assumed that was where we were going with this because we actually don't know what that process of confirmation looks like. Mm -hmm. We know what the deadlines are in the charter. We also could quite possibly not act on this at all and just let the clock run out. Mm -hmm. But the question is, but under what circumstances why, might we choose to do that? And so I would think that would be something that the appointments committee that has just momentar moments ago been named, um, would try and figure out and bring back a recommended process, not only for these people, which maybe we would do faster than normal, perhaps, but also for future reference as to a process under what conditions we let the clock run out and under what conditions we move to positively approve or reject. Okay, yes. So doesn't this particular Commission have some urgency because they, you know, if we delay this too long, we don't have a body that can approve the various licenses that they're un under their purview. Paul. I, I would think in this particular circumstance, a motion to refer may not be appropriate. Let me ask Paul. Um, thank you. Uh, there is time for it to be referred to, or de to be given to a, a committee and come back by January 28th. I think the uh, council would need to act by January, well, 
it should act by January 28th if it wants to take an action. Mandy, Joe. So we should not forget that this bylaw review committee by its charge actually has five members. These are two of them. The other three will be town council. We're not on bylaw review. We're on. Uh, oh, sorry. Licensing. I'm looking at the wrong Board one. Board of license. Okay. <laughs> Never mind then. Okay. Never mind. Okay. Yes. Just, fo just following up. Yes, it's true that there is actually in the charter the list about 60 days for a board of license commissioners. Okay. Um, but in the meantime, we, we still are within that 60 days. We still will be on the 28th. And in the meantime, we, we talked about this months ago, is that we are not holding up anyone who's applying for a license. The town manager has the authority to act on that in the meantime. Right. Thank you for that clarification. In addition to that, I'm also aware that the select board went out of its way to approve as many licenses as it could possibly approve before they sunset. So we want to thank them for that. Um, it, so the, uh, ref, the, rec, the motion is to refer this to, to refer the appointments for the Board of License Commissioners to the Communications Outreach and Committee Appointments Committee. And ask they follow up with a recommendation to the Town Council. There was a second, a motion and a second. I'll second it. Okay. Any further conversation? Yeah, I just yeah. One quick question for the town manager, and that is, are there any applications that are for totally new licenses that will need to be acted upon in the next two weeks? No. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, then call the question. It's a roll call vote. Kathy votes yes. Shalini yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? She already, oh, Sarah? Councillor Schwartz. <laughs> yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Greismer? Yes. It's unanimous. Okay. Uh, the issue of the Resident Advisory Committee appointments is not going forward tonight. And we haven't accepted the charge anyway. And then the human resource director is the next. And this is our first time to have the town manager come forward with an appointment, um, recommended appointment for a department head. Um, the, and Mr. Bockelman, would you please speak to Evelyn Rivera Riffenberg's appointment? Yes. So. Uh, tonight you've received, uh, in, in accordance with the charter, I've referred the appointment of Evelyn Rivera Riffenberg as the Human Resources Director. It was simultaneously filed with the town clerk as required. Uh, Ms. Rivera Riffenberg is a um, high quality, um, experienced Human Resources Director. She is currently the Director of Human Resus Resources for the City of Chicopee and an adjunct professor at Bay Path University. She holds a master's degree in communications and information management and is a certified human resources professional. She's chosen based on her, qual her qualifications um, as required. Um, she had her, uh, we're, we've completed a background check and um, the interview process and everything came out. She's a very exceptional candidate replacing a very exceptional um, hu current human resources director, Deb Radway. I want to mention that our uh, review process was uh, led by Assistant Town Manager David Zomack and included personnel board member Rebecca Woodland, who is also an Associate Professor of Educational Leadership at the University of Massachusetts, um, DPW Superintendent Guilford Mooring, Public Health Director Julie Fetterman, and Amherst College Chief Human Resources Officer Marie Judith Rodriguez. We received 26 applications. Uh, the committee uh, offered interviews to six people. Uh, they recommended two that I interview two, which I did, and I selected 
Ms. Rivera Riffenberg, uh, and she has accepted the offer subject to uh, action or, or non-action by the council and background check, et cetera. The, her resume is attached. Um, it's been her contact information, of course, is redacted, uh, and I think there's enough information in here for the council to either refer, or approve, or take no action. Um, so let me just say, we have three options. One is to act one way or the other, confirm or deny. Another one is to refer to a committee. And the third, fourth is to ignore it and let the clock run out for 14 days. Because if we don't take any action, it's automatic in 14 days. So do I have a motion? I'll move to confirm. OK. Is there a second? You move I'll to move to approve. Any further conversation, discussion, questions? Dorothy. Um, I have a question. Um, it, the resume looks very, very interesting. Uh, I'm just curious about um, the number of, of jobs in, um, that, like six jobs in, in 12 years. And what is your question? Um, well, I guess, I, I think it just, it's an, it, it raises questions, that's all. But it may be that each job was better than the one before. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. it, when we explored that, that was not a concern to our interview team, our screening committee, or to me. And I, uh, there's no commitment to us for how long she will be employed, nor a commitment to her to how long she will be employed here as well. So we're not under contract or anything like that. Any further conversation or questions? Yes, Lisla. So one of the responsibilities of the new committee is to serve as the committee to review and advise the town council on all candidates forwarded by the town manager for employment as department heads. So that's where that charter uh, piece comes in and also that referral piece like we just used for the Board of License Commissioners. Mm -hmm. However, given that we haven't met yet, we have no idea what the process is gonna be, and that somebody's name is out there in public who, for a job, um, I am, without establishing precedent, I am leaning toward going ahead and approving this, rather than trying to let the clock run out when we don't have any kind of process for why we might decide to reject or why we might decide to let the clock run out. So given the particular circumstances we're facing, I think it would not be unreasonable to not do the referral and to go ahead and do the approval. Okay, any other conversation? Yes, Evan. I just wanted to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, agree with Alyssa. I think that um, we have a committee to, to go through this process. Um, and so I think it's, it, but, this is sort of an exceptional circumstance, especially I believe Ms. Radway's last day is January 19th. So before the council will meet again. Um, and so I think there's a number of circumstances that warrant us, uh, warrant action tonight, uh, but with, with sort of the acknowledgement that this is something that we will not do uh, regularly and that it is uh, because of exceptional circumstances. I have only one correction to your statement. We're meeting tomorrow morning at 9. <laughs> yes, right. Is there any other question? Yes, George. Just a question for Mr. Bachelman. Do you feel that these are exceptional circumstances, and do you feel a need for haste on the part of the council? Every department head is an exceptional person. Um, I, I've always been uncomfortable with this provision of the charter because when you're hiring someone, extending an offer of employment, um, there's a lot of reasons for, a lot of times when someone can say, no, I've changed my mind, their employer to make a counter offer, the better, the quicker I, we wrap this up, get through all the steps that we ha need to get through in order to make a confirmed offer of employment, mm -hmm. the better off we are. And this is, is an exceptional personal person, I think, that will really serve the town well. Other comments, questions? The motion on the floor is to approve the appointment.
of Evelyn Rivera Riffenberg to the position of Human Resource Director for the Town of Amherst. Call the question. It's a roll call vote. Kathy votes yes. Councillor Balmill? Yes. Oh, they're still there. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Greismer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. It's unanimous. Outstanding. Okay, we're moving on to approval of minutes. And we have three sets of minutes, December 3rd, which has been before you. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed one thing. It's council appointments, and it's to the bylaw review committee. And although we are not appointing anybody else to that committee at this time, um, I just want to mention that I have been in touch with all three members of the previous bylaw review committee, and of those, Robert Ritchie and Bernard Kubiak have agreed to continue to serve. The other members will be appointed once we clarify the appointing authority. Yes. I'm going to move to table this until the next meeting or until the time we are ready to appoint the council members. This, the minute we appoint members to this committee, the former committee is dissolved and does not exist. And if we appoint these two members at a different time than the three members from the council, we have appointed a committee that cannot meet because it won't have a quorum of appointments. So I think we should do the two at the same time. Okay. Uh, made, there's a motion to table. Second. Any further conversation? <coughs> All those in favor? Uh, roll call. <laughs> Hi. Yes. Okay. All right, who are we on? Councillor Ross. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Yes. Did I hear Councillor Shane? Yes, you, you did, yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Greismer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. It's unanimous. Okay. All right, now we're moving on to approval of minutes. The first set of minutes are December 3rd. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. A second. Okay, so we have a motion to approve by Schreiber and a second by, I'm, no, by uh, Pat DeAngelis. Alyssa, discussion. I have, I have a format issue. Okay. What a surprise. Um, what, which is that even if no one's absent, please list counselors present, counselors absent, none, as opposed to just leaving that off. And it would also be helpful if we listed us by last name alphabetically, unless, of course, we decide to go by first name alphabetically, but whatever. Um, I find it very confusing to try and go through a long list of names that has no apparent rhyme or reason to it. So that might be helpful to others, but specifically I would like it to say members absent even when there are none. Okay, anything else? There's a motion on the floor to approve. Do I hear any other questions? Call the question. It's a roll call vote. For December 3rd, yes. Councillor Balmill? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. 
Councillor Dumont? Abstain. Councillor Greismer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. And Councillor Pam, sir? Yes. Okay. It's 11-3. Uh, the vote is 11 in favor, two abstentions. Thank you. We're moving on to the minutes for the Saturday, December 8th meeting, which was the um, Amherst at the Amherst Palm Regional School Library. It was the four towns meeting. We called a meeting because there were going to be more than seven of us. There were going to be seven or more of us there. Do I hear a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Oh, okay. I move to approve. I'll second. What is going on? Okay. Um, any further questions? There's like a, somebody in uniform that wants to be let in. They got locked out. Thank you. Um, they probably wonder who's broken into town hall at this hour. <laughs> All right. Um, is there a discussion of these minutes? I want to point out that probably the only people who should be able to vote on this are the people who were present. So we will need a roll call vote, but we should go by the names of the people that are on here. The others should just formally abstain. Abstain. I thank you. Okay. Yeah. Call a question. You're allowed to vote even if you're not there? Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, Councillor Shane. Yes, approve. Councillor Balmill. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Abstain. Councillor Schreiber. Abstain. Councillor Steinberg. Yes. Councillor Swartz. Abstain. Councillor Brewer. Councillor DeAngelis. Abstain. Councillor Dumont. Abstain. Councillor Greismer. Yes. Councillor Haneke. Abstain. Councillor Pam. Yes. Councillor Ross. Yes. Six in favor and seven abstentions. So that doesn't pass. It does pass. Okay. All right. Uh, moving on to the minutes for December 10th. Do I hear a motion to approve? George, thank you. Second. Shri Steve Schreiber, second. Discussion? I just have one thing. I'm sorry, Bar Darcy. Um, minutes aren't in the packet. They were on the point, SharePoint. They should be in the packet though, right? They are. You online now. They're in the electronic you packet. The page of packet materials? Never mind. <laughs> Was that you throwing rocks? <laughs> okay, is there anything else from, yes. Yes. <laughs> she was wondering what you were doing standing out there. <laughs> okay. Um, Mandy Joe. 
Kathy had sent you potential comments um, for these minutes. I missed them for the December 3rd one, um, okay. but for the December 10th one, she indicated that she thought Darcy had recommended the change to the start time from 7 to 6.30, not you as president, um, and she wasn't sure who seconded, and she figured it wasn't me since I didn't support it. So we might want to make sure we have who moved to change the start time and who seconded it correct. Was that the Darcy one? You, you moved to, it was Darcy that yes. moved it. Yes, it was who, I. And I very well could have seconded it. I can take credit for that great idea. <laughs> I'll let Steve take credit for that great idea. Actually. Okay. <laughs> Let's refer to the governance committee. <laughs> okay. Um, Steve seconded it. Are there other changes? Other questions? Call the question. It's a roll call vote. Councillor Shane? Yes. Yes. Councillor Balmill? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Abstain. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Abstain. Councillor Greismer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan. Yes. It's 11 in favor and two abstentions. Okay, we're moving on to committee reports. Are there any committee reports from the council? Seeing none, we're moving on to public comment. <laughs> there are some ruffians uh, throwing rocks at the window. <laughs> We've had a small disruption this evening. Um, is there anybody in the audience who would like to make a public comment? Thank you. Um, my name is who's this? Meg Gage, I, District 1, and I was a member of the Charter Commission. Uh, so I, I want to make three really brief comments that are sort of tips into a much larger conversation. Um, there's several things, the charter, I'm really impressed with how the council's starting with the huge amount of work that the staff has done, and particularly the town manager and all that you've done and the paying attention. I guess I'd like the metaphor, flying a plane while building it, I'd rather think of it as a train, but uh, a little safer. Um, there are some things in the charter, though, that are ch make your job challenging. Um, I say this not as a critique of the Charter or the Charter Commission, but I know Mandy and I both have lists of things that we wish were a little different. So I'd like to uh, come to the Rules and Procedures Committee and suggest some of the things that you might be aware of so that you develop a group culture and practice that helps ameliorate some of these challenges. To give you only one example, how do you recruit people, good people, to really important committees when they won't have a vote? I think there are ways to do it, but I think it's a challenge. There are several things like that, and um, I think it's hard to I just encourage us all to be having the conversations so that we keep going on such a strong footing. I also am really excited about the energy that's gone. <clears throat> I'm still out of breath from running around in the cold. <laughs> Anyway, I will adventure. Um, <clears throat> uh, terrific energy that's gone into thinking about citizen participation and recruiting people for committees. And the, the, count, the, the Charter Commission cared a lot about that with the uh, community involvement officer and the uh, resident advisory committee and so on and, and other things in the Charter. Um, I really urge everyone who's working on recruitment to think 
not just about how do we get diverse people, but putting, but setting up a kind of infrastructure for outreach so that it's ongoing, not just dependent on a few people making a lot of phone calls all the time, but creating outreach infrastructure so that we're always finding new people. And the incredible talent of the council, including a lot of people who haven't been that involved, is just an indication of how many great people are out there um, wanting to get involved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Meg. Um, no other public comment at this time? Okay. Uh, we have a couple of meetings coming up, the first of which is tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. And then on the January 15th, January 16th, and our retreat on February 2nd. In addition to that, we have a regular council meeting, although all of those will be, in fact, open meetings, on January 28th at 6.30. Um, is there any council comments at this time? Mandy Jo. I just want to do a shout out to both Kathy and Shalini who have made extraordinary efforts to actually attend and be here for this entire meeting. And I just saw Shalini pop up a, a finger, so I think she might want to make a comment too. Okay, Shalini. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, actually, to Mandy Jo for being here present to our comments and uh, participating. Then also shout out to the technology people who made it possible for us to participate. And it was fairly smooth. I could hear everything and participate. So thank you. Right. I, I want to just second that and thank the technology people. And especially after you went over to that little closet and changed some knobs, and uh, all of a sudden we could hear people from miles away. Um, so and also, Mandy Jo, thank you for managing that. Alyssa? Quickly on a completely different topic, on our agenda, which currently is, says, you know, committee reports under item 10, which I know there weren't any of, but taking a page from a former body I was part of, it would be a good idea to go ahead and the town manager will know what I'm talking about, have an attachment that shows what possible committee reports might happen, because otherwise you start to get people who are like, well, I didn't know you were going to talk about bylaw review that night. It's like, you know what, we might talk about it every single okay. night, or we might not, and, but you don't don't clutter up this page, you just add it as an attachment. I'm adding that to my 17 page script for tonight. Thank you. But um, it should appear in the, it should appear attached to the ad list of, ta well, attached to the agenda when it gets uploaded, not to the SharePoint, but for the public so they can see that. Okay. Thank you for that suggestion. Any other comments? Yes, Dorothy. Um, this is to our town manager. Um, tomorrow morning, we come and meet, I assume, in this room. But uh, I know my granddaughter's very excited about the fact that she thinks she's going to get a snow day tomorrow. So I want to know, do you have snow days here at Town Hall? And what are the provisions? Um, very occasionally. Um, we do, we'll send out an alert that says there's a, the building is closed. It's not like a school uh, was closing, though. So generally, we're open for business. The meeting will go forward. We hope everybody will get here safely. No. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a few shops down the street that might be able to accommodate you. Anything else at this point for comments? Topics not reasonably anticipated? Hearing none. Executive session, we're not. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Steve says yes. I rise in acclamation. <laughs> and second, all those in favor? Aye. Do we need a roll call? Oh, no. Oh. I rise in acclamation. I, I, I want to do the following. Would you ask the two people if we can adjourn? Uh, is that affirmative? Councillor Shane, Councillor Baumilne? Yes, Shalini, yes. Yes, yes. And the rest of us said yes. <laughs> <laughs>